very good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Balaji Srinivasan. I'm a faculty in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And uh, with respect to this program here, I'm also the advisor for placements and internships uh, as far as the BS degree program is concerned. I know uh, you guys had uh, several choices to be uh, in, at this point. I'm happy to see several of you uh, show up here. And that actually shows the importance of this particular program. So what we have today is actually a couple of panel discussions from uh, several industry experts uh, uh, that, have, that have come from uh, multiple industries. And uh, we will first start with one uh, uh, you know, discussion on uh, are the skills that are learned now relevant for jobs in 2030? And then it will be followed by another panel discussion. But before I start all of that, let me first quickly go through a few slides for, especially for the benefit of our panelists, as to what this BS degree program is and, and where are we uh, in terms of skilling our students. So, this is actually the uh, flow of uh, you know, the students in the, in the program. So they enter the program through uh, an in-course qualifying examination. And of course, we also allow those who qualify for JE Advanced to be part of this course as well. And then they go through a foundation level uh, in a set of eight courses that just prepares them for the, you know, further courses there. Then it's followed by a diploma in data science and a diploma in programming. So they could choose to uh, do either of them. They could possibly exit with one of those diplomas. Uh, but if they continue on, they would go on to a BSc degree level where they are actually getting some uh, they're becoming an expert in some of these uh, in data science and programming. And then we go on to the BS degree level where they are going through much more advanced courses. Right? So it's, it's essentially a multiple entry, multiple exit type of program because we have an entry into the diploma level itself if uh, the students have already been equipped with the foundation level knowledge. So the, of course, the big difference here is doesn't require JE. You know, it means before this program, you had to qualify through JE to be within this campus. But now with this, we are uh, relaxing things a little bit. And of course, uh, the overall, uh, because that is not an on-campus program, the overall cost of the program is much more reasonable. To date, we have uh, several thousands of students that have qualified, uh, uh, close to about 20,000 students. Most of them are actually the foundation level, more than 50% of them in the foundation level, but several of them going on to the diploma level. And we had this wonderful event yesterday where uh, 18 students who had completed the uh, degree, the BSc degree, got their degrees, brought their provisional certificates yesterday, along with several hundred students with uh, diplomas. So that was indeed a proud moment for us. What is also uh, you know, very important to note is our students are spread all across the country uh, in, in places like... Uh, uh, Bihar, West Bengal, Jharkhand, uh, you know, and, and some of the northeastern places where the quality education may not be available to them or it's not affordable to them. And uh, we are able to provide an opportunity for those students as well. Um, and of course, I, I should mention that, you know, it's just two years into the program, but we have already been recognized at a global level. Uh, so this is the Wharton School with uh, uh, QS, who have uh, given us this, uh, you know, silver award for, for the best uh, online uh, program, degree program. And uh, in terms of skills, which is what we're going to be talking about with our panel uh, uh, today, we implement, we, we are, we are we're actually providing some very basic skills, uh, coding in Python, uh, statistics, 
programming in Java, and so on. And uh, at a diploma level, we are starting to give them uh, it, it, you know, tools in data science, machine learning techniques, machine learning algorithms from the data science diploma, and uh, advanced SQL and database design, web application development, and API development as far as programming is concerned. And further, in the degree level, they get to look at some of the latest trends as far as uh, this field is concerned, you know, sequential decision making, data visualization, design thinking, cybersecurity, software testing, speech technology, industry 4.0, so on. So this is just a sampling of courses. Of course, there are many more courses that uh, the students can choose from. And these are the kind of things I would like to get uh, feedback from our panelists on uh, a little later. Uh, so from the perspective of the companies, how can they engage with us? One is, of course, you know, participate in the student YVAS. There is a lot of hundreds of projects that we uh, that the students are doing and uh, we would need industry support to evaluate those projects and from the industry perspective this could be your sneak view into the you know the skill sets of the students so you can you can you know start looking at them from a diploma level onwards and uh, of course we would like you to be knowledge partners so what that means is that you give specialized lectures uh, what are the latest trends as far as this uh, uh, this data science uh, field is concerned. What is what are the kind of things that are being uh, uh, you know uh, carried on in your respective companies? Uh, it could potentially lead to a module in a course, or in the future we can even think about a specialized course also if that is actually acceptable for most of our students. Uh, we are also looking at internships and recruitment. Uh, and we are also looking at CSR partners. Several of you have already been contributing to that and that's actually been excellent because we have almost 20% of our students in the below poverty line uh, you know, in, in that domain and, and your contributions are really making a huge difference in, in their education. And of course, you could also think about upskilling your own employees uh, employees that have been trained in something else, but they want to, so for example, they want to acquire data science, uh, uh, you know, uh, expertise. They could po possibly take specific courses from this and so on. So, with that sort of introduction, let me call upon one by one uh, the elite uh, panelists that we have today. First, I'll call upon uh, Mr. Srijit, who is actually the director of engineering at Amadeus. Then um, Mr. Uh, Ajay Ganapati, the product development leader at Cargill. <laughs> Mr. Balaji Upli, who is the CEO of uh, GS Labs in GAPS Technologies. <laughs> Maybe you can slide in. Okay, then I'll call upon uh, Mr. Tritru Patel, sorry, Tritru Pal, uh, Director of uh, ANI and Citigroup. <laughs> Mr. Yogesh Krishnan uh, from Google. <laughs> Mr. Ganesh Sankralingam from uh, Latent View. And last but not the least, uh, Mr. Aninto could not be here with us today. So instead of him, uh, thankfully from Wipro, Mr. Santosh is here. Thank you all. Now, this is how, how we are going to take this forward. There has been a series of questions. Some of them have been curated by us. 
for our students and some of them from the students themselves that have been uh, posted here. So we will go through one by one and we'd like, uh, you know, request you to uh, take up the whichever question you think uh, you are, uh, would you'd like to respond to. And uh, then we will open up the session for students here who would want to come up and ask questions. Okay, so let's go through the set of questions that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that you're having to turn around to do that, maybe we can, okay, so this is one of the key questions that we are here for. So overall, you know, we talk about what are the skill sets needed for 2030, but I'm not even sure we have that kind of visibility. So I won't put you in the spot about 2030, but the next few years, what measures should educational institutions take, like, like this program? What, what we should do to equip aspiring data scientists and programmers with the necessary skill set to meet the demands of the job market? Any of you want to? Hello. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, Balaji, you will be in a far better place to answer <laughs> because you're running one of them. <laughs> But uh, the, I, I just want to see the industry perspective of this, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll take a first crack. Uh, so, see, I think, I, I think before we dive into skills, it might be easier to think about uh, at a high level framework, uh, what's happening. Obviously with AI, um, you know, and other technology, there is a lot of changes that are happening in how we do work, what we do, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, there is a lot of work that is getting automated and potentially getting automated. Um, while, but that being said, there are other few things that will happen over the next few years. One, the world will go through a transformation phase. It's not at the end of the transformation phase. So while we are very much into the development of AI, right, the adoption of AI, we are only at the beginning when you think of the larger world. Uh, and as you, as we think of this, you know, the current skills are not going to become completely irrelevant in the next five years. You know, that's the first thing we need to understand. You know, programming, analysis, data science, you know, and if you think in the larger world, all the skills that we have will remain uh, in at least for some time, uh, more or less in the way it is and it will keep. The, the second thing to keep in mind is that increasingly technical, more technical tasks and knowledge based tasks, right, being specialized knowledge because you're a doctor and you know some specific disease thing or your specialized knowledge because you know Python coding, you know, that will become less relevant and interdisciplinary thinking and thinking that allows you to kind of bring in human ethics, human emotions mm -hmm. and things like leadership, you know, things like communication, those things will become far more important. Mm -hmm. So one of the clear implications of that for courses like this is bring in a little bit more of interdisciplinary stuff, right? Bring in stuff around understanding different industries, mm -hmm. uh, bring in stuff around, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the ethics of data privacy. Right. Uh, you know, those kind of things will actually help because if you think 50 years down the line, a lot of the work that we do today will get automated, but a but lot of the leadership work will probably not get automated, right? And, and that's when you will need interdisciplinary thinkers who can, who can decide uh, correctly. And then finally, there is a whole emerging set of jobs that are emerging because of the advent of AI and technology. Now, there is, of course, you know, AI programmers and designers that you will need, which is a very, very big uh, set of people you will need. But there are two other sorts also. Again, coming back to the more interdisciplinary piece, which is there is a huge around, uh, huge workforce we will need around managing the AI 
ethical implementation of the same. You know, there is already lots of people looking at content uh, in in many companies and managing that on top of an AI, right? The more ubiquitous AI becomes, the more you will people like that. Mm. Uh, in our banking industry, uh, use of algorithms are highly regulated. Mm. Uh, so banks have to employ people who are uh, into model algorithm regulation and management and regulators employ people like that mm. uh, to look at that. So that's a huge area when we think data science. We only think data scientists who are building models, right? right, right. But you need people who are data scientists who are regulating models mm. and understand what needs to be regulated. Right. And then finally, there is a, as I said, there's a transformation happening. Uh, so you will need people who can you know, kind of look at, you know, industries and figure out where the applications come, work with different sets of people, do change management and enable their transformation. And several companies are uh, already starting to do that. So again, maybe it's a little general, but the framework is that I think expanding out beyond just technical skill sets, I think is the way to go. Uh, and, and that's where the jobs of the 50 year future uh, lie. Right. That, that's very nice thoughts uh, before I listen to others. Just one quick point about the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we are going to be facing and how the students are going to be facing. How do we imbibe that on the students? So one thing that we are thinking is like when, they, when we send the students out for internships or apprenticeships, you know, the students learn these sort of aspects from the job. Is there something that we could do at the course level to promote that, do you think? Yes, Yogesh, yeah, please. So one of the things that educational institutions need to start thinking about is like uh, Professor Balji mentioned about um, internships and apprenticeships. I think that is a huge shift that Indian, Indian educational institutions need to go through. It is not something that most of us, at least on this panel, have might have had the opportunity to do so. But given the fact that almost every job today is data intensive, so I'm in marketing, and you might think of marketing as an art rather than a science, but I would argue that is as much of a mathematical science as it is an art. So whichever kind of a profile that you would like to go into, data is going to be at the heart of it. So what I would encourage educational institutions to think about is not just in terms of one month or two month internships, mm, mm. but rather think about what can a student go through over a span of six, seven, eight months. And mm. not just, not necessarily at the end of the course. It could be something that's at the beginning of the course because some of these characteristics like leadership, empathy, and uh, a an acute knowledge of the industry comes only from some of those real life scenarios and not necessarily in a right. classroom scenario alone. While the classroom is important, while uh, there are a lot of the basics which are imparted at the classroom, but at the end of the day, these real life scenarios cannot be replicated and duplicated in, in a lab. Sure. And I think that's where industries like ours, whether it be manufacturing or, the, or tech or hospitality, need to start looking at um, apprenticeships and, and internships on a longer basis and actually involve students in strategic projects that matter mm -hmm. rather than saying, hey, you know what, here's a small project for two months, let's get something out of the door and here's your certificate. I think that's a fundamental right. shift that right. we all have to go through and it's something that educational institutions such as yourself. Sure, very, very nice point. In fact, I, I forgot to uh, mention as far as our program is concerned, in the BS degree, we do give credits to students to go, uh, up to 12 credits, we give them to go to a company and uh, do an eight-month apprenticeship. So, so that is actually as part of the program now. But uh, you were making this point about doing this early itself. One point that we thought of doing it early is that they need to have some basic skills that they can provide to the company. So, so we thought they need to actually have a certain level of uh, training before they go out to the companies. Um, but, but your point is 
you know, we could probably make it slightly earlier so that they can understand what's going on in the industry and curate their program around it. Right? Yes. Thank you. One, from an institute perspective, I think, you know, you'll have to look at from what skills that change and what skills that don't change very, I mean, I mean, which are more permanent. So I think when I looked at your course, I think you already have incorporated a lot of that. I think you were focusing on maths and statistics and uh, data structures, algorithms, system design. There are few which are like, you know, theoretical and that is required and which doesn't change with time that often. And then you'll also have to focus with the industry trends. I think there are a lot of forecasts which come. I would, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to incorporate some of those trends as well. For example, if you look at Gartner Hype Cycles, which they release every year. Right. I think I've been following since 2020 to early 2000s. So I think there has been a very good validation to some of their uh, forecasts and in some of the bets they've probably in early 2000s when they said cloud will be a big thing. I think in by 2020, by mm -hmm. 2010, it was pretty big. Mm -hmm. So I think some of those industry uh, consulting, you know, the leading consulting firms and so on who've been coming up with their reports, I think if we look at their forecasts, right now they're talking about, let's say, uh, computational neuroscience mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. derma computing. And uh, they're talking about, let's say, you know, some... And also what this industry would need by 2030. For example, in Cargill, we often talk about sustainability. You know, how do we feed a world of 9 billion population by 2050? Mm. And how do we do that more sustainably? Mm. So those are like, you know, there's so much investment going on in the Bay Area right now on sustainability, or on air environment and on climate. So how do we, you know, build better products, which are, you know, which, with, with lesser carbon footprint, which means we'll have to educate students on, you know, climate science and, and right. the, all aspects of that as well. So I think that's where we'll have to, I mean, you know, if, you know, further down, if you look at, you know, yeah, I think it could be about, you know, space research. I don't know. I mean, you know, interplanetary uh, travel and all of that, right? Yeah. So we'll have to look at, I mean, incorporating that, I think at least giving the students a way to focus on learning to learn. I think that's a meta skill as, as well. We'll have to somehow teach everyone saying mm -hmm. that, you know, it's not enough to just learn something and then, you know, think that it is, that is enough for the rest of their lives. But how do they, you know, keep, you know, having that, uh, you know, inculcate or, you know, in an innate manner uh, uh, to have that learning to learn capacity, constantly look out and constantly keep buying books, keep reading, you know, research papers. I think that's very important in the industry today. That's what we've seen. I right. think if you just say, hey, I th have the skills and, you know, that'll be enough. No. So you'll have to, constant to constantly reinvent. So that, that meta learning strategies, I think incorporating that will also be helpful is uh, what I feel. Great. Yeah. Learning to learn. <laughs> That's the word. Uh, Srijit, yes. Okay. So look, um, I, a lot being said, right? I mean, so the basics, so what we see on the ground, you know, if you look into all those internships and people who we offer, you know, get from the campuses, strong theoretical skills. Mm. When it comes to practical skills, I mean, you know, they struggle. Yeah. You know, even people, you know, the students coming from computer engineering background, they struggle to code. I think this is something, you know, should be changed, right? I mean, so there's a strong technique, I mean, um, the theoretical bit, but then I think there should be a focus around the practical bit. I mean, right. People should spend time to kind of, uh, you know, do how, how to code and so on. And then if I look into the curriculum, right, still a lot around C++ programming. I mean, I'm not saying it is bad. But then I guess there is <laughs> a lot more it can be done in the curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. Why not? I mean, okay, Python, I saw Python in your curriculum. Why not R? Why not some of these, you know, uh, the new programming languages? Why stick to the C++? I mean, it's quite, uh, you know, so I think the curriculum has to be changed. Perhaps, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, uh, so the practical bit, the curriculum. And third, I mean, look, what we look into the industry is, I mean, we want people, I mean, to come in and to be productive, I mean, as soon as possible, right? right. What we don't want to do is, spend six months, I mean, to train them to be productive. I think this is the trend, I mean, which we need to see, I mean, how we can change it. I mean, if you can change it, that would be quite good, I mean, at least for the job market for 2030. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Ganesh has thank some, you. yeah. So I have a slightly different point of view. Like, I mean, students, when I look at them, they're like a sapling plant, right? It takes three to five years, right? They're coming out of a very good institute mm -hmm. like IIT Madras, and uh, congratulations to the professor, and thanks for inviting us to share our views. Mm -hmm. They've grown well, right, from the past three years. And the industry has a responsibility to fine tune them in their own areas, right? Like project management, client management, very nicely covered. 
And the other aspect is uh, financial analyst, marketing analyst from an analytics perspective, right? Right. So if I were students, uh, we onboarded about 400 campus IS last year. We'll probably onboard an equal number. Step number one, you're going into a recession year. Next year, till June 2024, it's going to be a tough year. I mean, I've seen three, four recessions so far. I mean, all of us here have nothing you can do about it. Yeah, yeah. One. Two, but the gentleman brings about a very good point. You will have to join a company to learn real life experience. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion, uh, what are the skills, whatever skills, I think it's been very aptly covered. Please stick with that company for at least two years. Mm. Right, I mean, but gentleman from Google is smiling. It doesn't matter which brand, it's a generational problem, right? I had an intern, second month he was applying outside. I'm like, why don't you finish this project, right? Six months, eight months. No, 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 I need to improve my resume. And then what happens is uh, my motivation to educate and mentor him goes down. I'm like, yeah, just get me a cup of coffee and do this and you're done, right? That's exactly what happened. So do, uh, again, uh, a lot of skills that are covered, already covered, you probably know programming skills, math skills, ethics, integrity, project management, team skills, winning the trust of the team, delivering on time. Those cannot be taught in a college. It right. has to be taught in an environment, in a services environment, like a Wipro or a Leighton View or a GAVS or in a product environment, right? Uh, uh, but for you to learn that skill, you need to go to the office in person. I've seen so many gig working happening. You will not learn as quickly as you are being mentored in person. One, you need to stick to that company for at least two years. Any mm. company here, mm. services, products, and it's for your own good. Only then you will learn that skill really well. Uh, the third thing I would say is full-time. Uh, try not to do a part-time gig. Full-time, paid role. It doesn't matter if it's in analytics or a data engineering or a data science, in a captive, in a services. All of them are good. All the uh, leaders I've worked with are fantastic, right? And uh, start off with, uh, uh, so that you can pick up the skill. So these are the actions I'll give you. <laughs> you're you're going to have a tough time getting a job. Get a job. Stick to it for one to two years. Uh -huh. Complete two projects, end-to-end -end life cycle. It could be in web application yeah. that they have been trained in. Right. It could be in data science that they have been trained in. Uh, it could be in data engineering uh, using any platform, GCP, AWS, Azure. Right. So that would be my advice uh, to the team because project management, ethics, teamwork, communication are the skills that will be valid for another 100 years. Very nice. Thank you for sort of summarizing uh, a lot of the thoughts here. And and this is actually a very good uh, a message to the students also. We've had students who have been coming up and asking, you know, I've done my diploma. Is this the right time to go out and get a job? Maybe, yes, if in a, in a normal situation, but given the recession that we are facing, maybe you're better off focusing on upskilling yourself, getting into the degree program, getting more uh, skills developed and then face the job market when it's actually a little better maybe next year. Maybe one one thing you could think of in your course structure, right. just to bring in some of this flavor of application, mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, a little bit more case study based. Right. Right. Uh, even, you know, uh, data scientists, programmers thinking about big problems mm -hmm. and applying to that, you know, whether it is sustainability. Just thinking about what does sustainability mean mm -hmm. uh, and how could you apply data science to that? We, there is a famous example on application of data science on spreading of Zika virus in, uh, right, that was tracked and managed through mm -hmm. data science by tracking movement of mosquitoes and all of that. Right. Uh, so I think if, if students are getting used to applying technical skills to more general questions, whether right. they are business questions, governmental questions, societal questions, does not matter. Um, I personally am an economist, like trained in economics, and we learn statistics and econometrics. I think one of the good things about being in economics is you're forced to apply technical skills to some problems. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes you very naturally ready 
when you enter uh, enter a company or you enter any other field so maybe a little bit of case studies on some big problems uh, trying to solve it through right. would just enhance this application type of stuff that we are talking sure about. Uh, actually so we do have some case studies that we discuss in as part of our courses but i'm sure that could be updated constantly and if the industry can provide some inputs into that that would actually make it more relevant i think to this santosh you had some comment yeah let's lighten the mood it's, it's been a serious <laughs> discussion um always the service industry has the last word <laughs> because i count some of you as our customers uh, so being the ipl Check season uh, yes you know let me throw a googly why do you think you want to work for us why should that be you know your ultimate objective so i'm just reading so with the necessary skill set to meet the demands of the job market the job market why don't you create your own so one thing that i wanted to uh, you know being a service industry i would love to have people and we've been discussing with multiple people to how to get the the right skill but do keep in mind that you know you can do something on your own so at the very beginning you know if the course can also think about inculcating in you know, entrepreneurial skills yeah right uh, how do i get closer to the customer all right um how can i listen uh, you know to the need the demand of the customer and then map it to what i am studying would help you to create your own paths thank you very nice uh, nicely put uh, so the the on campus uh, uh, program does actually have some thing worked into that but i think we need to get a little better with the data sciences uh, how that entrepreneur spirit could be uh, you know cultivated so we will look into that for sure uh, i think we already discussed this particular question you know what are the strategies individuals adopt to continuously upskill and remain resilient i i think we already talked about that so i'm going to skip uh, skip that question um yeah so with the increasing integration of automation and artificial intelligence what are the uniquely human skills that will be valued in the job market of the future sure. i yes. think uh, yes. this is already talked about that some of the management skills some of the interpersonal skills some of the sk skills to you know do interdisciplinary sort of decisions uh, uh, you know I, i think those were some of the things that you had uh, projected you want to add on to that uh, no not to add i just wanted to say that i think um, learning about humanities is going to make a comeback in mm -hmm. the next 20 years right. right and having a sense of uh, you know when you say uniquely human skills what are uniquely human skills right is art hum uniquely human you know there is a lot of ai which has kind of decoded art into a set of whatever unknown rules and producing brilliant art right uh so uh but a but a more sense understanding of what is right what is wrong what is acceptable what is not uh i think is there the other aspect that we have to keep in mind is there is certain kind of things that as a human you will be a little fearful receiving it from an algorithm or a machine mm. right like so there could be that a machine very soon could do surgery better than a human doctor but how many humans are willing to go through a surgery uh, from a robot right it's just a human emotion resisting you from adopting the technology uh, you know and and you can go to many other services that we get in different industries which potentially a large amount of the human beings will prefer to get it from a human being think about like psychology you know therapy right you will probably want that to come from a human doctor rather mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. uh, uh, stuff so here the technology may be there but our adoption may be lower because we are somewhat fearful or skeptical of the technology
So in terms of automation, I do believe that some of this adoption has already started, but maybe not in as high stakes um, regions like what you mentioned. In my profession, for instance, we're already thinking of using generative AI as an example to uh, put together art pieces or blog pieces or content pieces. But as I mentioned, those are lower stakes. You don't have the risk of somebody losing their eyesight or, 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 or a limb because there's, there's an error on, uh, on the medical equipment. Although to be said, it's already being used in some, in, in some cases. But having said that, uh, the reality is that automation has always been a threat to jobs ever since Charles Babbage invented the calculating machine. So the movement of the nature of jobs has always shifted with how technology has been adopted. Um, I was reading somewhere that generally speaking, the <coughs> replacement or the type of jobs lags the uh, uh, introduction of a new technology by about five to 10 years. So I would say for the next five, six years, um, some of our jobs might be safe, but then if we are not ready or if you're not willing to learn and relearn like what was uh, spoken about earlier, then I would say I would, I would be at risk. So I would believe that my job is at risk, not because of automation, but my job would be at risk because of someone who knows how to use automation, who knows how to apply AI, who knows how, how to use the right type of prompts into Copilot, ChatGPT, and, and a bunch of other um, generative AI tools that are there out there. To, to, to add to what you just said, right? Look, the way we look into automation, artificial intelligence, um, you know, for me, it's very simple, right? I mean, it's based on past data. You know, you look into the past data and then you try to repeat. I mean, you know, um, you do the repetitive job a bit more automated. Makes sense. I mean, why do you want to do the same thing, I mean, you know, over and over again? I think his you know, example around uh, medical, I mean, you know, you want a robot to do the surgery or, you know, diagnose a disease. Let's face it, I mean, it can diagnose a disease which is already discovered, I mean, you know, which is known because, I mean, there is data available for it. I mean, can't find the new, you know, if there's a new disease which is out there. You know, I don't believe the AI will suddenly, you know, uh, discover something which is not there. I think this is where the skill set of human beings, I mean, you know, for us, I mean, will change. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. for us to invent something new, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, you know, we will have something new to do. I mean, you know, once automation comes into picture, I don't believe it will destroy humanity. There is a fear that, I mean, all the jobs will be lost. I don't believe it is the case. I mean, there will be new jobs which will get generated. Right. The world will move on. I mean, you know, this is good. I mean, I, I guess at the end, I mean, we need to embrace and move on. Like you said, I mean, I think adoption is already there. You know, okay, there is, uh, you know, in certain areas we adopt faster, in certain areas we adopt, uh, you know, a bit later, but eventually it will be there. But then, you know, we move on, I mean, try to do something new. Right. And that's where, I mean, you know, we should use our power. <laughs> yeah. And knowledge. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Professor. Is, yeah. And uh, thank you for inviting us. Sure. Uh, for this uh, fantastic session in the Sunday morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I think uh, you spoke very well about the human aspects. You spoke about the various skills. Let me put two, three scenarios in perspective for the students to understand. About uh, six years back, uh, I was in a conversation with the Goldman Sachs leaders. And Goldman Sachs always takes pride in coining something new which can attract their customers. Hmm. Um, they went through a rough phase, and I'm sure all of us know about what they went through. They came out with a uh, a nice coinage called SWAN, S-W-A-N. SWAN. Smart, hardworking, articulate, and nice. Nice appeals to the NASDAQ companies, right? So nice was there. And we analyzed that and we found uh, JP Morgan, we found uh, Citibank, we spoke to some of the leaders at Citibank. One of the advisors of our company is an ex-CTO of Citibank. So he was also part of the conversations and we came back and adopted that within our own organization as SWAT, S-W-A-T, we removed NICE with a T, <laughs> technology. technology. So what I then realized, we put a SWAT filter in every student, both in the internship, campus program, and from the market coming in as a filter. Everybody seemed to a clear literally in hard working and mm. technology. Mm. But they struggle in smart and articulate. And I think that's a skill which will live forever. He said that. I mean, 100 years from now, smartness and articulation will continue mm. as a key element. So that's one perspective, right? And, and I'll club it together at the end to summarize how these perspectives come together. The second one is we had a conversation with the head of technology from Volkswagen. Mm. 
and they were in this uh, car, driverless car conversation. Right. The technology officer stood up and said, uh, and we were like 40, 50 data scientists in the room doing a white wording. And they said, uh, so your car is on the way, driverless car. And the opposite direction, there is a truck coming in. And Mr. Google, please pardon me for this. And I'm nothing against you. Bard is fantastic, by the way, right? So he's going to take a U-turn. And, this, and he's, he's jumped the signal. So he's going forward. So he can't take a right. He mm. can, the car can't move right because there's a truck coming in. Mm. What will the decision of that driverless car be is to move left, mm. naturally. Move slightly left so that there's no collision. But what if there's a pedestrian in the left? Mm. So is your life important? Is the truck important? Or is that individual whose pedestrian who's passing is important? Mm. Mm. No direct answer. And I'm sure AI models have figured it out and we know that driverless cars are going on. Why I'm saying is to go back to his point. The adoption of technology is far more important than the technology itself. Mm. And that's where the interdisciplinary conversation, that's where the human conversations, that's where the softer skills happen. And I think the two important aspects which everybody, not just the students, even for us, he was saying about whether we will survive after five, 10 years. If we don't make ourselves relevant, we're out. Right. Right. Technology will change. Projects earlier were 18 months, came to 10 months, came to six months, and now it's a month. Anything more than a month, technology is out. Right. We actually developed a product for a recent hospital about 45 days back, and that technology is now seventh version of the technology which we started. God knows where all it will go. So technology will keep advancing. Human mind, creativity will continue to advance. But are we making ourselves relevant? Are we becoming smarter in adoption of technology, which actually means a lot of things. Understand the industry, understand the customer, understand everything. But the last and the fourth most important thing, I'm sure there are HR people in this audience, so they'll be able to relate. If I do not stand for quality and perfection, I'll be out. 99% right. quality is not enough. It has to be 100 or even more. So sense of quality, Communication, which is articulation, articulation and being smart in adoption of technology, I think will go a long way mm. in creating ourselves being relevant mm. rather mm. than fearing about what technology advancements can happen. Right. Technology advancements can happen. I learned C. I have no idea when I'm going to write a C program ever. Mm. Right? But the idea of the myth behind C makes me to believe that I can adopt any technology. Mm. Mm. That's, right? true. That's how I view it. So smartness articulation, making yourself relevant by figuring out how to adopt technology to solve a business problem with high quality. I think those, if they remain as a center of a person's DNA or a characteristic, I think will make them to grow faster and right. be relevant in whatever job market they need to figure out. Yeah. Thank you. I, I suppose smartness is also this, what the previous phrase that was uh, catchy, uh, learning to learn, right? Learning to adapt to changes and, and, and go forward. But in terms of understanding the technology trends and, and following these technology trends, of course, panel discussion like this really helps. But this is like a one in a year event. Um, but getting into, you know, somebody else mentioned that previously, if you want to look at the technology trends, read the, all, uh, the latest reports, the Gartner report or, or, or whatever, right? But those are expensive for this sort of uh, 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 setup. What else can we do to, you know, follow these technology trends to understand what, what are these? We actually did that even in, yes, Kamala ma'am will tell you, uh, when we had a session looking at the curriculum and others, we actually recommended two things. Involve the industry early. When Sorry, say, involve industry early. early. And yeah. when I say early, not just the industry coming in. He said very clearly, and I think we should see whether that can be done. People should come for internship as an entire program. Mm, mm. It doesn't necessarily have to be the last three months, last two months. Right. Maybe once a, once a week or one day in a week, let them spend time with the industry. Mm, mm. Right? Then they'll be able to coincidentally or simultaneously figure out how to adopt technology because they're learning new. Mm. How do I know, for example, I created... A, a technology which is unique for a doctor. Until I put to the doctor, I don't know whether it's right. Mm. 
but if i am putting it to a doctor i need to be with the doctor right right so similarly if i am learning something unique as an algorithm in ml or a data modeling through my advanced sql program if i can relate to something which the guys on the floor are going to adopt to solve a business problem then it sticks to me quite well rather than a the theoretical conversation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. my submission which i think some of the foreign universities are now doing i think we should start doing it here is start internship and you may not want to call it internship you want to call it something else start internship very early mm. so that parallelly they can figure out how the adoption of technology can happen to solve a business problem mm-hmm. nobody is coming to a table now to saying i am best at artificial intelligence i am best at data science nobody is coming to that people are willing to accept a conversation with you if you are able to solve their business problem right and technology is an enabler i mean yeah. today that technology can vanish after 3 months something new will come and right. these guys are going to go to location zero wherever they are i'm going to figure out what to invent new mm-hmm. and we have to adapt to that mm-hmm. but if i'm not able to apply that technology to solve a business problem i'm irrelevant mm-hmm. so how do i make that continuous convergence between what the industry needs and what you're learning my submission is if you can make that internship equivalent mm-hmm. from the very beginning i think mm-hmm. their knowledge and adaptability also will change and mm-hmm. the interdisciplinary thing will start even early Mm, mm. later on saying to say okay you have understood for whatever for one and a half years now put it into practice it's going to be a herculean task for that individual poor guy and you you rightly said people don't stick for two years people want to change jobs faster those don't work i mean right. it sounds nice but it doesn't work <laughs> right our ability is to figure out how to make them industry ready rather than technically ready right and if that industry readiness has to be there put them to the industry much early Mm-hmm. right from day one that's fine i mean two months they will struggle but they'll figure it out mm-hmm. but that is a much better way of adoption rather than making it a classroom oriented that's my submission sure sure thank you well s- said just yes please uh, what well, very well said balaji i think from a from a student's perspective i mean i think this is these are some of the meta learning strategies i use right you know i just follow the blogs of all the you know like fang at all including google and all of them that's one and then twitter is still a good source a lot of the chief scientists of many of the companies you know do posts you know what's that like you know you have updated you know on linkedin yesterday which your article got posted right i yeah. mean you, pub- yeah. you published a research <laughs> Thanks so for i think that. so that way i think so i tend to follow some of the professors like you and others right so that, because everything has a s curve right in technology it all starts with research and then it gets into some pilots pocs and then comes to the commercialization for example uh, uh, when we had the attention model in 2017 that no one kind of you know really looked at the potential of the transformers until you know chat gpt is fully commercialized it and they're making you know a killing right now right. so now everyone is like oh okay that's a bet really you know worked out so so one thing is you follow all the you know what are reaches what what is that they're doing and then try to see if you want to take a bet on it if you really like you know have a passion for it right you develop a passion for that that's one way but not all bets will come true for example blockchain there was a huge hype curve it has gone through and then you know they were they everyone said it will revolutionize how we live and how the society mm-hmm. will conduct transactions with each other and so on but that never ever really happened because there are other you know challenges from our regulations from us you know how human societies collaborate right so one is you know keep following the latest trends through all of these and then the other is open source projects you i mean additional to what you can be part of industry and if you are part of a r and d uh, initiatives as an intern nothing like it right you can be part of some of those latest trends but if you are part of like a you know like a general product development or something then you may actually develop a lot of soft skills which were talked about which are still uniquely uh you know human and there will be a lot more pressure on some of these soft skills going forward because a lot of automation and then everyone will be looking at what is your level of creativity compared to others right or what's your level of leadership so that is any way you will get from industrial or experiential learning but being part of open source projects i don't see a lot of indians being part of the yeah like open source projects i think that's a that's an important i mean that's something where we can actually you know create a huge revolution like what santosh has mentioned right like you know like india can be the powerhouse for building a lot of new software mm. and that can happen if we are all i mean some of you p- take part you know as active contributors to a lot of open source projects that are out there and develop a lot of critical skill right. so yeah that, 
some of the yeah. Yeah. great so, thank, so you. I'll, I'll thank you thank you be more even more prescriptive right the technologies we are seeing from the services side so we work with uh, google microsoft uh, apple hp some of the large clients uh, transformers we saw that uh, four years back itself open ai we started working in them last year so when we started like 10 years back saas was an in thing have you has anybody here heard of saas show of hands sas right that was the data science tool and banking sector probably still believes by it right then r came in how many of you have worked with r right yeah the hands have gone down and python how many of you have worked with python yeah, part of the curriculum right <laughs> julia how many of you have worked with julia there you go just check with them what is julia julia is a great opportunity for us to connect it's launched by i think google is supporting some of it as well uh, it's a much better framework than python 5 years from now again it could go the blockchain way or it could uh, come the other way and uh, cmi and iit madras i believe are contributors to julia libraries mm. right you come up with a new algorithm the old way was to publish a paper and have it in record the new way, way of doing it is actually creating a package and making it accessible to industry leaders like us right mm. if you convert a package right. research package on forecasting uh, arima with optimization or uh, Uh, GAN space neural network, right? You can take that as a project, mm -hmm. convert it into a package. Come to us saying, "I'd like to implement this package in environments." Mm -hmm. We'll mm -hmm. be happy to open it up if it's mm -hmm. a Python based, and if you show us better accuracy, you know what? You definitely have a job, right? right? Uh, and it will also see value in your side, right? Yeah. So th that's something I promote internally, right? That's how India can become a thought leader and entrepreneur leader, right. as it right. was mentioned. think about those lines the other thing i'm seeing heavily is uh, you know 5g launch uh, past 20 years right uh, human generated data is what we were analyzing the you know social media data facebook whatever right whatsapp amazon reviews what not right the next 20 years you will be most likely analyzing machine generated data telemetry data right 5g will start capturing all your data all the way from your ac data to your tv data to your laptop data and you will be able to analyze that most likely you may end up in a job where you are with an oem a car a bmw's data or a ford data again it's not like something that's going to happen they are already doing it most likely you will get anal uh, uh, you know going back to this cross disciplinary point you might go into analyzing the you might be a mechanical engineer with a data science minor mm -hmm. and you may go into some of these roles to analyze their data you might have a marketing degree and you might be analyzing campaigns data with google Right? Mm -hmm. uh, same thing. You can have a finance major, and you might be building regulatory models with AI. So having a cross-disciplinary approach in these two areas uh, would be my point of view. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Santosh Asam. Okay. So let's. Uh, how many of you are staying in uh, Narmada Hostel? Okay. Now, why did I bring up Narmada Hostel? Is it's famous for one thing. Can any one of you guess what it is? They they staying here temporarily. For no, okay, the... <laughs> fine. So uh, that place is very famous for monkeys. All right, if uh, you do not have a chance, please go to uh, you know Darbada. There's a big mango tree there, and um, you will see that you know the monkeys are enjoying more than the students. Just an off cut remark. Now I'm just trying to relate with the uh, the automation and. artificial intelligence there's something called cognitive evolution right now if the monkeys have reached that level you know why uh, you know humans have to do repetitive task is that not a waste of our cognitive ability it is not that you know we don't have a choice to employ people doing repetitive task but of course you know from the industry it is uh, what you call it it doesn't be more profitable so first point is that it is a waste of our immense god given talent if we limit our ability to do regular works you know you we call to do something of a higher order the second thing i want to talk is of my daughter uh, you know when she was about uh, fourth you know uh, five or six years right and we always make our children you know to write a lot right and uh, you know we were always asking write right so one day she asked me papa i have never seen you write in the last two years <laughs> why are why are you asking me to write something right and because she's you know the generation now along with you 
their mode what you call it uh, they use uh, a very different kind of what you call it communication you know the way that you know they do it in mobiles we, I, i can't do that so what are the values the unique human skills that are required as creativity curiosity and confidence these are the three things that if you can imbibe at a very beginning stage right and that is what sets it apart uh, you know for your uh, you know future success thank you great yeah very nicely said i i suppose i mean you may see some correlation in some of the thoughts Uh, that that we are talking about it said in different ways but but then the message is the same that that you need to be smart you need to be articulate that what balaji was pointing out and you need to be creative and uh, you need to learn learn to learn right so those are some of the thoughts that we are hearing i have several other questions but i, I don't think that matters now that we covered most of the essential aspects of what you need to be uh, imbibing as as students uh, so i'm going to skip most of these questions and maybe if we have time we'll come back to but but i want to emphasize some of the questions that came directly from you i want to make sure those are getting addressed so the first question is considering the rapid growth in the tech industry how can iitm best prepare students with the relevant skill sets i think this is something resonating with one of the first questions that we discussed uh, so i think some of the thoughts that were uh, projected was expose the students to industries uh, maybe think about internships at a very early stage itself and you, you don't want to call that internships but just basically industry interactions at a very early stage so that's one thing i think iitm can do now is figure out where your demographics are and and then figure out whatever uh, the companies are around and and tell you that these companies are there and and possibly find a way to link you to those companies as well so maybe you could visit them in a formal way informal way we'll we'll figure things out but that's that's one of the key things to understand as we go forward um what are the cyber security skills that are relevant to the industry there any specific thoughts on that look on the cyber security thing there's a mixed panel you know if i'm not wrong but then uh, you know to be specific on the cyber security nowadays look network architect network security is a key element which is going on in the industry there's a lot of focus i mean moving workload to cloud network security somehow suddenly become you know key and then there is traditional ones like the penetration testing you know uh, security architecture i think there is now you know the compliance bit you know the gdpr the pci becomes somehow a bit hot as well i mean an awareness around some of these elements are quite key i mean if you're working in the security architecture um and then the architecture principles i guess there is a lo- lot of demand for security architect out there and uh, we seem to have very little i don't know for some reason uh predominantly because i mean we are moving to cloud i mean everybody is moving to cloud right and the cloud the network the security architecture is completely different from what you do uh traditionally so i think that's the specific right. skill i right. mean technical skills i mean yeah. you know i don't know I, I, i suppose there's going to be a lot more spoken about in the next session but but if you have some quick thoughts no, on i that. think um, in addition to very specific skills which are needed in cyber security i think the awareness is very important mm-hmm. and i'll tell you why it's important people who develop code also need to be knowing cyber security <clears throat> it's not just a cyber security team which will separately handle and figure out how to take care of the security posture of the company which is very important i'm not questioning that but especially in today's world with so much of advancement in technologies human creativity also is going up so negativity also steps in so that's not a challenge but the problem is in cyber security what we tend to forget and i was uh, working in another customer about 2 years back tested beautifully product was fine user acceptance testing done the the, the uh, team suggested let's go and we rolled it out so second day then the alpha customers or the beta customers whatever you want to call it with testing one of the education institutions is actually a publishing company and they did a right click and the entire code was available mm. <laughs> right <laughs> this a cyber security team alone cannot solve mm. the awareness the knowledge about how to align to lots of cyber security principles or security principles 
is very critical even at the development engineering people mm -hmm. right product engineers are there product teams are there here they they are most hurt if in case they don't take care of that particular thing so awareness of security principles are very important number one number two unfortunately security is a boolean it is it cannot say that i'm 99 percent secure yeah. that means you're not secure right so you have to be tighter there so there is no element of compromise if a cyber security expert or a security clearance expert and i don't want to take the thunder away from the next panel i'm sure that's going to be the most debatable point it cannot be saying that okay 99 things you have ticked off one problem is that go to production then we'll figure it out it can be the route for uh, attack mm -hmm. so there has to be a tighter governance which is put in to clear things which are security related i think this warrants that every student or every person who is learning to program or engineer has to have an awareness, awareness of what the cyber security yeah. or the security needs are. And that is something which I think people should be taught in engineering. So we are taught about how nice structuring of the code can we do. Right. How nice programming can we do? What are the faster techniques? But we never thought how to align to security principles. Mm. The WASP, mm. WASP mm. and other principles are there. They're very standard. Right. Those are not uh, earth shaking. But I think knowledge of that is extremely important. So if we can introduce in a curriculum Mm -hmm. saying that how to create secured applications. Mm -hmm. I think that will help a long way in they demonstrating that the application is tighter from a security angle as well. Right. Okay. So it's got to be more holistic. Um, and at, at this point, I think we have about 10 minutes left in the program. There are several questions here, but I want to give an opportunity to students here who would like to ask questions. And uh, Sukrat, Instead of you going there, why don't you stay here because the microphone is not going to work that far. Stay here, let the student come up and, and you know, queue up for questions, yeah. I, I would, at this point, also take the opportunity to thank a couple of people, more than a couple of people, Jaydev for, Jaydev is here? Oh, yeah, for, for putting up several of these questions. Sukrat for arranging all of them and, and, and getting them in, in shape. And of course, Kamala Madam and her team, for arranging this entire session itself. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Good, good morning. My name is Akshay. I work for HSBC Software Development India. Uh, the reason why I joined this program was to address a data problem within our team. We have five of us working in different countries uh, trying to address one, one issue. For the queries that have been going around that a learner of uh, data science does not have the vision to, he, he might have the skills to do a data, you know, presentation or a data reading, but does not know what to build. And those who know what to build probably don't have the skills test, uh, skills, uh, skill sets to come and start building that data model. How about, I mean, just a question, whether it's possible for the industry to, as a CSR initiative, to come in and add some lectures so that this bridge can be capped? I think it's a good question. I think it's more and more relevant uh, and it will become more relevant going forward, right? Uh, we, I mean, he does more than me, but data is a myth for all of us, right? And uh, figuring out how to get something out of the data is also a myth. <laughs> it's not going to be easily solved. <laughs> Otherwise, these ML programs and data science would not have evolved, right? That's why the reason is that Data is becoming crucial in whatever we're doing in business. As I said earlier, I think the collaboration with the industry, more not necessarily for a CSR, because CSR then what happens, people take it lightly. I have to spend some money, I'll have to go give some programs. I would rather make it more mainstream. As I said, uh, I mean, I was in a discussion with uh, Carnegie Mellon professors because we do, our some of our people in the onsite teach there. And they were saying that, every student has to complete 10 hours of genuine sessions, interactions with the industry every week. Mm. It's part and parcel of their curriculum. The reason why they bought in is for the point which you just said. Unless and until I do not know what I'm solving, and unless and until the person who's trying to solve does not know how to get it solved, if this integration doesn't happen, these two streams will carry on in parallel and it doesn't help the industry at all. Forget about the students, it doesn't help the industry also. So I think your question is very relevant. If there is one request I would do is make that change as fast as possible. Your students will be become more brighter. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question, just.
I have one quick question. Why, why don't you? Uh, sure. Okay, you have a quick question. You say okay. Quick let's question. see how, how that. Uh, for for students who are learning uh, very relevant skills today, they want to finish up the education period in much quicker or shorter span of time. Let's say not 18 years of schooling, uh, you know, not 12 years of schooling, but finish up with their graduation by 20 at the most, maybe a PhD by 24. How acceptable is such pattern of education when it comes to recruiting those students in the industry? I think this is a kind of a deep question. I mean, you need, I mean, I'm not specialized in educational theory, so to speak. But then one thing I've noticed is people who do, are not classically trained and I think some of these uh, skills are long-term skills. I mean, it takes long, you know, many years to develop. So I think human species have evolved in, in some of these educational, you know, uh, uh, the theory around how do we, you know, plan all this education or, uh, you know, the, till the adulthood. I think uh, I'm sure there's a lot of validations which have happened and they would have tested it whether, you know, if you train in five years and see what happens whether you whether versus versus 22 years and so on. But then in my, you know, view, what I've seen is tend to be, I think some of them who are classically trained tend to be a lot more grounded in theory. That helps a lot when you know, when some critical challenges come. Like, you know, it's it's easy to get to, let's say, a 90%, but getting to a 99% or later, I think that that adds, you know, some of this help. So I don't want to slack off on, you know, kind of having, you know, shortcuts for life. I think there's some of these patterns have evolved over many, many decades and centuries. I think they are good patterns. I think we should be valuing some of them. That's That would be my Right. Uh, Ganesh wants to add to that Can and I, then Santosh. Yeah, thank you. First thing, we've had a lot of my top clients, right? They'll give one particular table with thousand records and ask five questions. Join this, summarize this, do the performance testing and review the code with me. Whether you're a PhD from Stanford or you're BTEC. I have a master's from a well-known school. I'll, have, I'll say this shamelessly. Only thing that matters is your skills. Yes, the grounding matters, but at the end of the day, to clear that exam and get into that particular project, you have to, I wouldn't, uh, everybody, we spoke about everything around the industry, but let me spend a few minutes on the core part of our industry. I had a batch of 50 students this time, right? I gave them a SQL exam, just a structured query language. Mm. Only 10 of them cleared it. 40 mm. of them did not. They were trained classically in uh, BTEC and BE computer science and they couldn't, right? So step number one, I can be confident, I can be curious, all the things we, all of us spoke here, you can be all that, but if your skills are not there, you could have a PhD, you could have an MTech, uh, if your skills are not there, you may not be able to clear the first few hurdles. If, right. if I uh, can give a macro okay. view, a little bit of a macro view to that. Um, first is, I think uh, industry is still not supremely open to to different sorts of education modes you know actually the educational institutes are leading their versus industry you know uh, recruiting in large numbers from alternative ways of education is not very high yet we are getting there and i think we will get there but the institutions are leading but as a student you know um, one thing you need to understand, even now, you know, there is lower demand for this, this kind of skills at the moment than there is supply, right? Um, there is a lot more people trying to get in than who are in the industry. And in that situation also, we are getting people who are not fully skilled enough, right? So when you look at that gap, I think as a student, you should strengthen your skills and strengthen all the signals you have to give out to the industry that you have the skills, right? So just because you want to do the education quickly, fine, you could possibly, but is that the smartest strategy, right? Because you may be developing the skills, you may not be, but you're definitely not developing enough signals for the industry to know that you have the skills, right? So I think, I think we need to think a little bit more strategically about it uh, as to what kind of the demand supply uh, necessitates. Right. 
thank you santosh you had some comments also so first of all a disclaimer this is my personal views and does not represent the industry on a whole all of you must have cleared mathematics one right m1 all right if you remember that sets that see i am a student myself okay uh, so that's how you know i can relate to the audience today if you look at sets disjoint sets and uh, you know concentric sets right if you take industry as one set and uh, you know us uh, you know students why do you think we see this as two separate can we imagine you know concentric uh, let me simplify how many of you are familiar with crowd sourcing gig economy so that answers your question you know you have asked for all right you don't i mean again my personal comments there is the industry today is not looking for you know the 12 four but of course you know uh, with the apologies of the hr all right what i'm telling is that you know we have problem statement see uh, today students look at cgpa as their ultimate um, objective but we don't look at that you know you know what we look at profitable growth margin you know my revenue my cost so i will do anything you know to see those particular metrics are achieved so simple way what i'm telling is take advantage of the crowdsourcing where the problems of the industry are in open forums uh, i will lead you to do which you can take something called top gear where you can go uh, what do you call it look at the problem statement and develop your solution and you get paid for it that does not even ask uh, you know what is your educational qualification so that is a kind of maturity that we are come here for i hope that you know helps in answering your question yeah. hello thank you uh, uh, good afternoon uh, good morning sir my name is abin uh, from the past few years from the hit of corona our transformation has been pretty much uh, fast forwarded and we have seen that for the past few years the freelancing economy has been in a growth of more than 60 percentage and it's still growing and the remote working all those things are still growing and all but currently us and uh, euro being the top consumers of freelancers what will be the impact of us future graduates in the current job market and in the industry uh, especially in it and marketing sectors those which are famous for uh, famous in the free freelancing platforms Uh, so i just want to mention that will be the last question of session times already over but i will just take the uh, comments from the experts all right so um, despite what was put on the chat i don't actually work for google i work for a company called founded which used to be known as monster.com i think um, um, my my company's business is essentially to list jobs right and what we're seeing is that from a freelancer gig worker basis there's a lot of interest in people wanting to have a little bit of freedom and flexibility in terms of where they work and how they work because they want to match their passion and profession with a mission and that is leading to a state where people are willing to say okay i don't want a full time job right now i would rather work for, work for a bit do something on my own learn something new and move on to the next project but that does not mean that everybody falls into this sort of bucket while you're right there is there is a huge uh, set of people who want to be freelancers but there is a greater per population of the people in our country especially that who cannot afford to do that because think think about it this way the number of underprivileged people we have in our country who are aspirational and who want the stability of a job who want the stability of knowing that they know where the next paycheck is coming from where their insurance is coming from where, where they can rely on on something for their families for the next year is much much greater than the freelancer side of things right but having said that if you want to be a freelancer i think there's definitely a a, a tremendous uh, a growth in terms of the opportunities that are there a lot of companies are also willing to accept that they want people for specific projects which might be low stakes but the risk of being freelancer is that you might not get as as strategic projects as you want so your scope for learning especially at the uh, at the earlier stages of your career could be limited thank you sir. 
just to add, right? And, and, and just that would be the last yeah. comment and we need to move on. Please go ahead, Ganesh, sorry. Okay. 80%, uh, I'm addressing 80% of the audience who don't have work experience, right? 20% who have work experience kindly discount what I'm saying, right? 80% um, I would suggest you get your skills grounded in a proper structured environment in any of the corporates. Coming to office on time, coming to meeting on time, showing up nicely, uh, speaking the right things. That skill will remain for a long time. So I would highly recommend for the, and showing up in person. Only you learn these skills when you're talking in person. At least for the first two years, right? And once you have a skill set, you become a cyber security expert or a cloud expert or a banking regulatory expert or something. It takes at least three to five years in my opinion. Then you should definitely consider the freelance option at that stage. Learn your profession really well. Your, your yeah. academic institutes yeah. have done their best. Allow the corporates to teach you the best and then going into the freelance. And that's here to stay. Don't get me wrong. Gig economy, the entire thing is here to stay and the flexibility it offers is here to stay. But that will be my very clear advice to the team. So that, that would be like... Uh, Use the corporate experience as a finishing school before you venture out to freelancing. That's very nicely said. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. And uh, really, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all the panel members for the excellent uh, comments. A lot of gems that I could find there. Uh, so hopefully, some of those resonated with you as well, and you got... Uh, uh, you know, what you were looking for. So a big round of applause for all the industry experts. And uh, that actually brings up the uh, end of this panel discussion. But before uh, the experts go off, I just want to have one photo up. And also, I think the next panel also can come in and maybe have a photo up here. Just a quick picture. Uh, now may I request Mr. Jayadev to just uh, take up the stage and uh, invite panel two panelists uh, onto the stage. Uh, Mr. Jayadev, everybody. Thanks, uh, Suprat. So, uh, good morning and uh, please join me in welcoming the panelists uh, for the next round. Uh, may I please have on stage Mr. Ankit Agarwal, who is the head of IT infrastructure and global systems architect at Encore. Ankit. Uh, another of our panelists, Mr. Komud Mishra is unfortunately sick and he could not uh, make it. Uh, but please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Vivek Ramachandra, who's the lead architect, global technology and cloud platform engineering for Amadeus. We also have from Google, Mr. Babu K, who's the enterprise account manager and an expert in Google Cloud Security. We have with us Mr. Himanshu Kumar, who's a Microsoft technical trainer. And finally, Hemlata Shankar, who's the vendor governance and CBS TRGC lead at Cargill. So most of you, I don't know if some of you know me. My name is Jaydev Deshpande. I am a principal data scientist at Graminer and I'm also a degree level student in this program. Uh, one suggestion to the audience is if you have a question, feel free to come and occupy the seats near the front so that when we are ready to take questions, you'll be there where a mic can be easily found. Thank you. So thanks a lot for making it here on a Sunday morning. Uh, but you know we are all we've all been looking forward to this, and we've been waiting uh, to ask you talk to you about cyber security for quite a while since this was announced. So I, I'll, I'll begin with what happened to me this morning. As I was on my way here, I received an email from a member of our IT infrastructure team. This fellow knows it's a Sunday morning. He knows that. I am where I am, I'm not going to work and I'm probably in a cab or a hotel or something, right? Three servers which I'm responsible for have critical vulnerabilities, right? So he has sent an OWASP uh, report. There are obviously medium level, low level vulnerabilities, but who reads them, right? Now the first thing I'm going to do uh, as soon as this panel ends is ask if there's somebody from my team who also has access to those servers to get in touch with the IT team and then fix it, right? Otherwise, 
I'll probably have to find time and do it myself. So it's almost like you know they were waiting for a Sunday to arrive and they were sending out these letters. And uh, the I'm going to ex do exactly the least amount of work required to fix the severe critical vulnerabilities. I'm going to completely ignore the medium and low level vulnerabilities. Three months later, exactly the same thing will happen. So the biggest, my, I mean, my hypothesis here is that the biggest threat to cyber security is laziness and procrastination. What do you think about that? Like you could, I, I think we could place tons and tons of checks and balances in pleasure. We could hire entire teams like one of the previous planners was saying. We could hire an entire team to just take a look at cyber security. No guarantee of anything improving really. We'll still be just as vulnerable as we once were. What do you think about that? Generally thoughts on basically people's and teams' approach towards this problem in the first place. Vanakam and good morning every. Happy to be here and thanks for having us with you all today. To you, to your question, Jaydev, maybe I can start and we can please, hear please. from everyone. Um, the threat landscape is changing every day, every minute probably. And if we believe that we've fixed, we've taken care of all of the vulnerabilities and threats, it, it's almost like standing on the ground, believing that everything is fixed, while the ground beneath your legs is moving at a very fast pace. That's the reality. So we need to be constantly upgrading, updating, automating all those terminologies leveraging the technologies that we spoke about, AI, ML. So this is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and we need to be up to date. We need to be constantly updating ourselves and making sure that we're ready for future. If not futuristic, at least be near real time. Let's hear from others as well. Um, thank you, everyone. Oh, this was a nice question, and as you mentioned, if we can have as many checks as possible. The biggest link is us. Also, today, especially when we are talking about hybrid, remote work, there is no parameter. Earlier, we used to have a parameter. This is our corporate network. This is our office. This is from where we'll access you know, all the data and everything. Today, our employees are scattered everywhere. So that is actually a big, big part of what we have to address. Also, when you think about it, you know, you can have as many checks as possible and you can have as many devices as possible. But the biggest challenge is to educate your employees. You have to have a program where you, right from the onboarding, whenever you onboard the employees, so that they understand how to successfully access the corporate network, which app should be used, not used, what should the checks and, and all the things. I mean, we tell them, okay, you have to update your OS, how often do, do they do that? All of those things. So creating a program and an awareness within the employees is the biggest, I would say, the hurdle and also the biggest challenge in any corporate environment today. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, about educating and making people aware, in fact, that's something that we want to infuse in our programs here itself. I'll probably come back to that though. Yes. Vivek. Yeah. Good morning, all. Yeah. See, one thing I wanted to tell you very clearly how the things are changing, at least uh, Four years down the line, when we look at a security threat, even from a developer or even from any of the design engineer or anybody you can take, it was kept as the last priority. But things cannot be done similarly as of today. Even a small, small kind of a gap or some small kind of a security gap that you can see uh, cannot be ignored. And how that that has been incorporated as part of any kind of an problem even for a design, even for an architecture that we're taking, we actually take the security as part of the base, and even in any part of the product. So that's how things are being evolved. At least for the last two, three years, what I see in my company at least, so security becomes the pro topmost priority even for the security of the data privacy or even in terms of intrusion, what has been happening to our security we do follow very, very high stringent measures and it's going to be common for most of the companies. And to ensure that, we actually start from the root level. Previously, if I, if 
we look and look at at least from six or seven years before it was only discussion the management but now what happened what it happens is every person or every employee has to be educated regarding security even the manager is responsible for any of the security that that is happening and that has to be the case without that we cannot move forward and even for a product which has to move to any production phase we will have to deal with the security threats or understand the threat modeling around it and go about doing it that's the way we'll have to deal with otherwise you know that was uh, uh, what that prompts me to think is that uh, typically we view security as an extra step in compliance merely compliance it's exactly. it's like a tax you have to pay in order to make your app run instead what you're suggesting is that no that's not the case at all it's actually the very much part and parcel of the whole thing it's something that everything rests on right yes, yes. that's the so. way we have to deal with and that's the way the company and industries are dealing with that's what i want to point yeah jadev uh yes sir that is moving to the question no see you received a call from your it guy i would put up a different way that you are running some service on your servers what if you receive a call from somebody that your service is down because not from the infra very interesting i would so drop would everything you... and go to fix it first yes yeah. <laughs> very good point yes so the point is why we treat this cyber security landscape as a secondary measure we should not treat it because what are the services you are running you are running on a highway and that highway is infra if you don't keep it updated if you don't you know, keep it uniform with all the security standards you will run into trouble the same way it is so when you receive it call you say oh, 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 what is sunday i am going to fix it on monday but if service is going down you will know you would be on some call and fixing it now why these threats come in your servers are connected to internet and when you talk about technologies we have discussed you know panel also like previous panel technology landscape is changing very frequently you have not technology which do not work if they are not connected on internet and when somebody connects on the internet you will receive a lot of tons of information and what we have seen is that when something is running on the internet developers and engineers they forget to align with the security standards is a term called as software supply chain management now you go to a github you download a code but have you ever seen what that code is written into it what dll is used what micro component is used which can destroy the entire server so if those security principle standards are not maintained you will always receive a call from security expert on saturday and sunday and often by which time it's too late to get yeah. rid of that dependency yes, and introduce dependency. something else yes. so that is a, so it goes hand in hand so it, we are talking about cia confidentiality integrity and you know availability if you want three things in place for your services you have to make sure that the components you are using to build that thing they are secure and you know it is not the responsibility of it to do that but it is the responsibility of everybody and the cyber security guys they help you now to inform proactively rather than reactively the change which has happened previously the change was something has happened and they will tell something has happened now they are doing it proactively identifying that this is a potential source of problem and if you don't fix it you have a risky scenario Bahu, i mean like just to add a couple of points uh, right i think uh, majority is actually covered in how it should be handled especially when it comes to a vulnerability management process as such uh, i think it has to be a workflow where you make everybody accountable right yeah. right from the yeah, the end user point of view and the second thing is uh, you got to have a, a kind of a priority how you are actually prioritizing your vulnerabilities like you said you know i fixed the high and medium and you gonna leave out the lower ones because there is a context to it right so the low one also is actually could create a high impact like when you actually connecting the dots that that example was a bit of an exaggeration of course <laughs> yeah and again uh, the vulnerability management is something uh, what we see is it happens a periodic basis right do you think the attackers are actually going to wait for you to actually do your neck fix those issues right so it is actually has to be uh, monitored and addressed in more frequently i would say on a daily basis as well and have a priority because if without priority uh, it's like you know you can't actually address everything in the first place right right, right? and uh, you know like i said 
it is the workflow where you actually properly uh, connected everybody very actually working together whenever these issues are actually coming up they are actually addressed uh, not in a reactive way but in a proactive way when you are increasing the frequency so this this has a very interesting uh, analogy to uh, certain things that we already know when you say workflow uh, generally you know there was a time when there used to be a separate qa team which would do testing or something on its own but nowadays test driven development is common whether actually people do it or not is a different issue but it's a well known thing that it exists and that does take off a lot of load off the qa and uh, quality assurance becomes very much the developers own responsibility it's a part of their process what uh, uh, we seem to be suggesting here is a security driven development also right so it it's not something that comes at the end but it's there throughout your uh, process right that's what you mean by a workflow which contains these uh, elements yeah i mean uh, just to add process uh, it's basically the process that you have is you find the vulnerabilities right and you prioritize them and you actually put them into production from the uh, patch management point of view yeah. and then you roll it out right and you if you look at the entire cycle it takes about 15 days if you have a time to roll it up it's going to be very a, a good workflow that you have that's what, that's right. meaning uh, but that's not the practical so again who is actually handling this entire process predominantly by your patch management it support team and also your service security team now what i'm saying is basically you also bring in the users also into the workflow oh interesting okay yeah. users also into the workflow who is also actually looking at you know my system is actually uh, you know uh, not up to date right make sure that you run some kind of a endpoint compliance solutions or scans on it the moment it does not actually let you connect the user is actually now coming back you know my system is not complying because the patch is not updated correct right so they also have the visibility in terms of you know uh, you know since i am also accountable for my own compliance of the system now they actually start reaching out to you and be part of your entire workflow right and uh, uh, to take the same step ahead we could also have white hat people join as testers or something like that right? is is that something that's usually done uh, is it is it too far to say that okay no i actually want a hacker to come and hack the system and figure it out <laughs> yeah there is also uh, a model to it so while you are assuming that my entire ecosystem is actually really doing good mm. can you get some kind of a red team kind of exercise we call them right what access i'm sorry red team red team yeah so red team is more of a offensive way where you actually run the attacks on your infrastructure while you uh, i mean uh, it, sorry if i can say this while you are assuming your entire infrastructure is actually secured in that team right. exercise what we try to do is actually if your crown jewel is your bank account where you have the money in red team exercise we give a objective saying that you know can you reach out to that particular bank account and transfer the fund from account a to account b i see right so how do you do that you actually punch your firewalls penetrate through vulnerabilities reach out to the account after causing all the security control see if you are able to do it so what happens with that while well, you are assuming that you know i fix all my vulnerabilities i have right configuration right controls in place but all these controls are actually working together in a way to actually keep the bad guys away got it, right got it. now you are actually testing is it working or not through the red team exercise yes. So coming back to the uh, education and awareness uh, part of it, uh, how many? Please raise your hand if you have finished a programming diploma. How many students here have finished a programming diploma? Okay, how many have done modern application one and two? Okay, DBMS, software engineering testing at the degree level. okay because yeah nobody raised their hand when i said the programming diploma anyhow so here's the thing we currently when we are uh, doing this course we have studied database security right we know what sql injection is we have studied uh, http security so we know not to transmit something without encryption we know not to access servers uh, through a secure shell with password based access it will be rsa based key based access or something might even be on a vpn and so on uh we know to keep our operating systems updated and our uh, dependencies updated all the time we know to you know do periodic security scans but it seems that all of these measures are uh, essentially reactions to things going wrong how do we become more proactive and what should we learn that's primarily for you and the others can of course contribute 
See, when it comes to security, as much as proactive you want to be, it starts with accountability. Yes, it starts with what? Accountability, right? Uh, especially when it comes to we have spoken about and people have spoken about different mechanisms, software development practices that we do today. Uh, it's just not enough to write code, right? How is your software managed? Your software is basically, um, I would say, seventy to eighty percent open source libraries that you go ahead and say. Now, when you go ahead and pick those libraries, there should be a mechanism first of all to understand which libraries should we be allowed to pick. What is our upstream? All right. Then, when we go ahead and pick those, there should be scanning done first of all, right, to understand whether the, is there any vulnerability, especially also licensing terms comes to the picture. All right. Then after that, when we are deploying our code or doing our today's DevOps world, so it's continuous integration, continuous testing, all those testing that we need to do has to be integrated within these steps, whether it's static code analysis, dynamic uh, application testing, all right, or uh, your interactive testing as well, like user testing and things like that, and finally penetration testing also, all those things. So first, before you go ahead and release your software, you have to do these things. If you don't do, and also you see, there is an approach called uh, shift left nowadays, right? Shift. Shift left. Shift left. Okay. Right. As much as you can identify the vulnerabilities in the very starting process, it will be much less of a hassle uh, to fix them, and also it will cost much less human capital and money. So that is also important aspect. So we have to enforce these cultures from the very beginning of someone who is joining our team, and yes, the access mechanisms, and as, as you mentioned. Those come on, I mean, definitely later on. But first, it starts with how you develop your application. What's your answer as a Microsoft technical trainer? What What are the few things? I, because I can see this question coming up eventually. What are the few things we need to learn to be able to be at that level where you know from day one, it's a part of your process, and you know there are not words there which don't mean anything to you. See, what we have seen, I mean, especially in our company, it has to come from an institutional level or leadership level. That culture has to be enforced because see, we are humans. We are laid back. If you ask us to do something extra, we'll say, you know what? We will kind of prevent it. You know, no, we don't want to do. So it has to come from uh, the top, saying that these are the things that we want to do in terms of security. All right, these are the trainings that you should do, and this is how you should identify. First of all, an employee should be aware about identifying the risks or threats. Phishing uh, is very common nowadays, right? We all get emails and things like that. How to identify that? There should be a mechanism. Once you identify, how to report it back to the management, and then after that, the security team can take it over, find out who the threat is and how it is done. Right. So those things. Also, one thing that has helped us as an organization is uh, we have to have some security champions within each of every single team that can actually enforce that culture and promote that culture of security. Vivek, would you like to go next? One thing I wanted to highlight about your question regarding the proactive. I just remembered my uh, kid, uh, not to be blaming the current generation. But yeah, uh, she's one year old and um, I just bought her a chair. Just for sitting. You know how people misuse. She used that chair to jump to the shelf. This is how people misuse any kind of a product. It's not that a product is done for a better purpose. We always see the other side of it. And to look into that, it's not so uh, easy also from a designer or an architect perspective. So the way possibly I would uh, recommend or way possibly any industry would like to go about here is, first of all, they should do a thorough analysis of what product is for and only have the scope defined for only for that particular people or particular set of audience. That's the one one thing we will have to really figure out. It's very difficult to figure out also, not so easy in that aspect. And secondly, what I will also see is, uh, is there a way to figure out these kind of a security at a very early cycle? It's not that testing has to be defined uh, by the product or from the team. Can it be defined uh, during the development or pre-development stages? Uh, then it actually saves a lot of money in that case. So this is what I want to highlight. Understood. So um, speaking of you know this culture coming from a top down, this is a question for everybody. What was early 2020 like for you when people simply you know could not come to office and everybody was working from home? What happened in your teams? 
and stories experiences how did you fix them how crazy was it how i mean i'm sure it wasn't easy for any of you but what happens when people can't come to office again from a security perspective at least this was for everyone across the globe yeah right not only for uh, i mean come organizations it was for every it was for everyone sitting here as well and right? one fine day we couldn't go to office right and you can imagine not everyone across the globe had mobile devices like laptops to work with number one we didn't have devices to work with and um, we had to depend on personal devices also yeah. and we had to depend on unsecure networks in okay. 2020 we had we even had cases where people use their ethernet connections or the local providers cable connection to connect to the network um and home network right so and beyond that um the access not everybody i mean the vpn pipes had to be multiplied because we had to secure so probably you know even to connect to your previous question to summarize all of that we said we had to security follows data right where is your data that's where security is what is is the most important thing we all had to worry about right what is that we need to protect so vpn was the solution but we we had to multiply the number of pipelines that we had the ba vpn bandwidth resiliency right we had to even make sure that our vpn servers were resilient and making sure that we leveraged all possible methods some of the apps had to be moved out of vpn so that everybody could access some of them had to be brought inside the vpn's controls for which we had to first know what what is that so we had to really, really revisit our data classification how do we classify that data i mean we spoke about crown jewels um we had and critical infrastructure probably many of us think um uh, security is all about or security threats are all about information that uh, or information theft how many of you think security uh, or you know the um, um i would say the hackers target information or their focus is only information theft Stealing how many data. of you think so in production companies like ours it's much much beyond that it is cyber physical harm that can happen if our ot devices were compromised so it was all about how do we get there first of all how do we enable people even allowing them to use their own network their own devices quickly bring in some policies around that what to do what not it all goes around i think 80% or 70% to 80% of security of any organization depends on the end users right it is the end users who had to be educated so i would say that we had to definitely look at the device first what is the data that we need to protect how would people access so without impacting the productivity so how would we educate people how would we classify our data after we find what it is how do we educate this and how do we strengthen our systems as i said we had to move some of them outside of vpn so everybody is able to access still bring controls through iam plays a major role here identity right. and right. access management controls so that is when you know what what is the five whys if we talk about what is important i mean what is the data that we want to talk about and why where from where became a issue be concerned because i think by that time many of us had migrated to cloud right not completely though and we had strengthened our cloud security by then in 2020 i think we were already in that journey which helped i would say that it helped it was all almost you know office 365 we were all on office 365 at that point of time so we were already remote right and and now it's all about the magnitude that we had to worry about and i would say i think i would look forward to talk more about um, the ot security, OT security. Uh, it is and and some of you asked about career opportunities but we will talk about it towards the end as well each of you have opportunity you know in being a cyber security expert but wherever you are right whether you're doing in uh, chemical engineering or instrumentation or whatever you're doing there is opportunity right so um, i would say that we had
to worry about how do we protect our data, how do we enable people to work, how do we ensure that our systems are resilient. And uh, I'm sure the security teams and not only the security teams, right, all the three lines of defense, the first, second and third lines of defense is they, they worked day and night. I think the first two, three months was really difficult. We didn't know what was the threat around us, right? And slowly understanding data following the security. I think we've been able to be here. I think this, is, this has become a norm. This is how the world would operate. And I'm sure this has opened up a lot of opportunities for everyone across the globe. I so definitely Ankit, would, uh, mm -hmm. uh, data scientists obviously cannot work without data. So it's early 2020. You are in office, you connect to a VPN, you download your data, you train your models, whatever it is. Suddenly, everybody's remote. And she might have had the luxury of putting certain things off VPN. Uh, what was your experience though? So, situation no, was similar for everybody. Now, what happened no, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? Companies did not invest it on maturing this entire hybrid model. So they were very safely assuming that you know, we have a boundary, a perimeter boundary where somebody we'll will always come into an office. Yeah. 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 And you know, I am making an investment to secure my boundary. As soon as I step out, my controls would not work. I am, my data would not be accessible. So that was a very safe assumption and nobody invested. See, technologies were there. If you talk about you know, companies, the cloud companies which provided the IEM, you talked about you know, Zero Trust Framework. So those companies existed since 2010. As your AWS GCP, they came very early. But the adoption was slow because you know, we did not want it to investment. Post pandemic, when everything went you know, offline, so the need was to protect the data. And what to protect the data? Because the developers who were accessing you know, laptops at home, unsecured internet, they have the luxury to open the sites on their will. And they had a lot of time lot of time where they can go browse the internet. They were sitting at home. Our travel time was cut down. Three hours that used to spend in office and chit chatting, that was on a laptop. Three hours I used, we used to spend on internet where we used to browse a lot of things. And we use, when you used to browse the things, you talk about data, you come across the data. And people forgot the clear line between the data which is personal and which is official. And they were really, you know, very hungry to consume the data and put up their credentials across the internet, regardless of what. See, uh, you take an example, no, awareness we talked about. We were very well aware internet banking we are using since ages, decades. We were new, you know, password were there, you know, OTP, everything was there. But there was no sensitivity about the IPs of the organization. Right? You know, people did not realize what could be the damages. It might be reputation, you no. Know, Companies have lost because of you know, cyber security attacks and those things. So there was a very much you know, need to put a focus on the data, securing the company data from the unsecured internet. And I would say it was a commendable achievement where organization adopted these level of security in, in, in months. And why? Because they were aware. If they would not have been aware, they would not have gone to this you know, fast pace of adoption. So uh, things were you know, very much there, uh, technologies were adopted. What took time is the maturity level. So the tools were brought in, they were deployed. But over the, these two years, those tools have matured enough to understand and everyone has come to terms that this is a new mode of working and this is how it will work. No longer my corporate devices are allowed to you know, access the personal data or something else. No, we, we don't want that. And if you want to access, yes, no, you can't not access from your personal devices. So there's no gradual shift has happened and the maturity level has come uh, within the organizations. So uh, in, in summary, uh, you were uh, resilient enough to make that shift quickly enough to cause minimal damage. But I'm sure there must be other examples of uh, teams or organizations or even individuals who were not so lucky. Can I add to that? Please, please go on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a few organizations like Microsoft, Google, they are actually kind of lucky enough that they have a lot of infrastructure around the globe. She spoke about uh, the scalability uh, aspect of it. Like uh, within days, we had to explode the entire yeah. VPN channels and things like that. Uh, how to understand capacity management and all of those things. So 
those were the challenges actually which we didn't face uh, and especially when talking about end point production our entire onboarding that happened uh, during that entire pandemic era we in my team also we hired a lot and uh, around 20 25 30 engineers even in my team we hired at that time uh, so and there were supply chain disruptions as well so we couldn't ship laptop to everyone at the right time uh, so they had to use their own devices right one thing that we did because whenever you are asking users to you know bring their own device uh, we don't know what the state of the device is right is it updated does it has any vulnerabilities because people can uh, put in any kind of usps and anything can be there right so we didn't know so having the right bring your own device policy uh, was the requirement at that time one thing that we did was uh, we didn't give any form of data or any of our uh, sensitive data on those devices yes you go ahead you bring your own device we'll see if it is compliant or not but what we did for we implemented implemented a remote desktop solution that even if you are on your device you have to log into a remote desktop that is within our premises all right within our control all the security policies are there you are just an access point all right and yes everything else whatever we needed like we have microsoft intune so uh, end point protection and things like that okay so the end point protection and uh, <clears throat> all the policy software updates so again one of the policies that uh, special like even in phones we have if your phone is not upgraded to the latest update like ios 16.5 just came if it is not there in two days uh, you will not be able to access any corporate data so those uh, checks and policies has to be there first of all put that in into that uh, management policies to make sure that device is compliant if that is compliant second thing what we did is again that remote desktop solution that we do not have any data on the personal device because where would we define or where would the personal and the corporate data um, you know bifurcate on the device so we didn't want to do that so we just implemented the remote desktop policy and then that device kind of became uh, only a access point for the users how long did it take uh, for you to put this in place the new security policies uh see i mean as i mentioned the scalability or even the team was not the challenge for us especially because we have been uh, working in this cloud infrastructure especially for on this hybrid yeah. for a while and uh, generally challenges are for uh, those teams which have uh, their own data centers and remote sites because they are built on on the as on the assumption where as uh, other people mentioned that we will be in this space and we don't need to go out and and do something else right for us uh, uh, the cloud and you know microsoft uses the product it's built so we use azure yeah. quite a lot right uh, in in most of us our teams so and the in cloud is kind of built on the premise that it is it will be accessible from the internet but it will also be secure right. so what was the story at google corresponding i mean uh, i can't relate i mean uh, a story to google but you know my experience Please. right uh, across different experience because i shifted a couple of companies during that time while everybody is actually busy uh, the operational aspect right uh, getting the laptops to the users if that is possible especially the large enterprises this shift is actually not so easy right it's very painful and the second thing is they need a, a computing machine second they need uh, the policy enforcement such as multi factor authentication tokens if these are actually a physical tokens that you can't actually uh, you know uh, distribute at all in the pandemic time so it now it has to be virtual right again have you tested it and that's again another pain so, uh, actually uh, sending couriers to people was it ever an option or, yep. or yeah that, that was not option at all right so people are actually started thinking now can we go to the virtual token options right it just a software uh, but again is it secure that's another question yeah, yeah. right okay while well, this is the onboarding process right the, the pain is actually everybody is actually going through the other side the threat actors are actually not sitting idle there it's an opportunity for them right so the amount of you know the threat actors that are actually targeting and the uh, issues that we see on the the uh, the cyber landscape has actually uh, keep increasing and we have a pressure in terms of you know can you suggest us what is that we should be actually monitoring proactively yeah given the situation while i am onboarding my workforce remotely 
and at the same time i have given some kind of a basic access maybe a least privilege but without actually those competing machines or those security uh, you know policies so there is a mid ground here where they want to actually closely monitor those threat actors how they could actually uh, you know use this situation for their advantage so there is a huge amount of pressure in terms of you know creating the use case what to monitor given these kind of use cases at least they are actually covering up to some extent right. yeah vivek what was the story with you in our case i think so everybody has covered most of the things what uh, we faced was educating the actual people uh, who are using the remote system so uh, with this regard our security team came up with a novel idea wherein they started sending some uh, something like a small animated movies uh, weekly or monthly movies it's a, it's a bit funny but uh, everybody has to take this uh, uh, sessions and see this movies understand okay this is the security part of it and uh, at least they get some bit of idea it's a mandatory training for each and every person within mads and it, it it actually makes sense and that's the way a security topic although it, it can be a bit dry to understand it was indeed making more thoughtful understanding of okay how security works and how it actually creates a problem so this is one thing uh, the, my company mads prioritized understanding the actual problem understanding the people that okay people has to know that these are the problem that comes about security definitely these infrastructure related problems were taken into account but yeah along with this this was one priority thing i would take so uh, this is a bit like preaching to the choir here but you know the driest of things can be made a lot more palatable with some sort of funny content right anyway so it it seems like there is a clear pattern here um, the more cloud friendly you are it's easier for you to be a lot more secure because you can leverage you know the solutions that are already there and the less like the farther away you are from cloud like more on prem and stuff it will probably take you that much more time to become secure in a remote environment is that a fair hypothesis like with how much confidence can we say this see why the cloud adoption has come because the companies who are maintaining the cloud they have a dedicated security team to make that cloud secure also exactly yeah and if i have to deploy something on prem with a set of servers and everything cloud the responsibility of maintaining that security comes on me that is yeah, first yeah. so the more and more adoption of cloud happens because of this reason only where we do not want to invest time energy in maintaining that set of service which can be easily hosted on cloud and when it comes to the cost the cost of maintaining my own team my own workforce to manage the servers offset the cost of moving to a cloud so when you say you know cloud becomes easy the deployment becomes easy yes it is easy but it is also easy to maintain that you no know, thing secured because the companies who spin up those saas clouds they have good rnd platforms available to make everything and more the security frameworks anything i you know off for the cloud you talk about iso soc 2 nis framework csa so those provide me an assurance that the entire saas platform is compliant to that so i don't have to invest anything where i have to run my own audits again i can comfortably go to the saas provider and say hey give me these you know controls only then i can move to cloud and they yes they happily give it so you know it's it's not correct that way that you know i do not want to keep i want to keep but the security concerns over keeping that that blocks me and no advocates me moving to the cloud how would you know that this is not short term like this strategy no. is sustainable how how do you know that this is sustainable because you no know, the cost of keeping on prem again it's going is increasing day by day people have moved after pandemic people have moved you now blindly you know lift and shift and they made because they want to run the business yeah. but now a reverse shift is happening only for the workloads where you don't want 100% availability so maybe they have moved the prod environment dev environment everything to cloud so they are bringing another dev environment just to cut down the cost and to utilize the existing infra which already have investment so hybrid is gonna stay hybrid is and wherever companies will have a chance they will use the cloud model the subscription model to have the services up and running agree disagree so i agree totally i think um, on cloud 
it's not that we moved our data to cloud and we can we don't have to worry about security yeah. it is a shared responsibility if you look at any cloud contract it's definitely a shared responsibility and major responsibility is on us because it's my data and i need to worry about the segregation where is it on the cloud how is it segregated what is the protection that i'm giving because i know what is the data i mean in the sense companies they know what is the data that they are moving it is a shared responsibility 100% and i also agree with him that there is a reverse sh shift that's happening probably because of cost and another reason that i'm seeing these days is privacy right so countries are changing um i was really impressed and if we look at uh, the it act uh, india it act of 2020 um the stringent and very clear asks from uh, companies outside of uh, india who hold and process our data indians data to bring a lot of controls around it so as this privacy policies and regulations change and probably they prefer moving some of the data on prem as well even that we are seeing in some cases so i would say that um is if it's on cloud is it more secure no i mean you need to, we need to still have a threat modeling done i think we used to do it one, probably it's not a, it's not even a one time activity now with cloud and all that it is an ongoing activity right so with change in regulations change in um, the threat landscape i think it's an ongoing activity we still own are accountable for securing our data um so i would say that the responsibility on organization still continues so in in short uh, you know cloud could be a dominant strategy a positive one but at the same time it's no silver bullet like you still have to there's still a few things you need to do on top of understand Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the way you are treating earlier the on-prem is actually, uh, it's not the exact way you can actually treat when it comes to the, the resources and data that you have, right? Uh, I mean, that's the one gap, you know, and the other one is actually trust where people are actually kind of re resistant or kind of taken time to adopt. Now, because, now the, during the pandemic time, now that has actually gone to the, another good level in a positive way, right? Now, coming to the, the shared responsibility, what ma'am just said, you know, people actually started exploring bringing in kind of you know uh, security posture management kind of a tools to look at what is a kind of configuration do we see any threats so i mean the proper assessment is required to understand what are the gaps that you see uh, you know when it comes to controlling your own data protecting your own data and putting mitigating control around it right it could be monitor prevention or detection controls and there is a negative uh, aspect that i could see is actually in on prem that we we used to have a proper uh, workflow in terms of you know if you wanted to provision a server it has to go through a process in terms of an approving somebody but cloud is actually brings a different shift to that right so yeah. if you have the service account you can actually spin the workload by yourself right without telling the security guys now that is actually uh, i mean the statistic says that you know 35% of the infrastructure is not known to the security team and that's a sweet spot for the attackers right so it is important that you know so you got like creating threats where there didn't exist any it's like we are only opening up the exactly, opportunity exactly exactly so you got to have a proper visibility in terms of you know what are your workloads that are actually floating on the internet are connected to the internet right and take a, a counter measure on it in, in order to understand okay you know how is the configuration is looking like bringing it back to your uh, uh, the vulnerability management cycle or monitoring uh, scope that you have so that you are making sure that you know this is not an opportunity for the attackers to exploit well to add to that i mean see there has been a myth for a long time that people used to think that cloud is cheap people have realized it is not cheap and one of the things as well where they make their own mistakes because of which it costs a lot of money to them yeah exactly you know there is no control mechanisms in most of the organizations and most of the customers that i have worked with we have seen you know the bill comes at the end of the month and they say uh, why my bill is so much and then there is investigation they say you know what the servers are up and running you are not using them your disks are there you have deleted the server your disks are still there right you have to control that now the good thing about and that is why i think some of the shifting back to on prem is happening because they have realized this is not exactly cheap for the silver bullet yes. yeah second thing why this shift happened is 
when you talk about any landscape what it is, or any technology stack, what it gives you, cloud is kind of giving you convenience and everybody wants convenience. If you think about threat monitoring and uh, threat hunting or cybersecurity landscape where you want to test something, all right, today in cloud you can just uh, have one deployment and you can do everything basically, right? To do the same thing, you will require a lot of expertise and human capital is not cheap. We've already seen, especially this year, human capital uh, you know, has been laid off a lot, right? So that is not easy to come by that expertise. And also the cloud is ready to meet you where you are. The cloud is not saying to you that, hey, come over, uh, everything. No, you want hybrid? We will work with hybrid. Here's our technology, go ahead, work with it. We will uh, protect your endpoints, all right? You don't have to work. If you are already using some things, yeah, we can work with that. If you're using Palo Alto Firewall or some existing third uh, mobility solutions or uh, IDP, IDP systems, all those things, sure, go ahead, keep that. Same things can be licensed over to the cloud as well. Right, so they are giving you a lot of options that wherever you are, we'll meet you, don't worry. And we'll make your environment more secure. Now, after that movement, once the migration has been done, maybe if you're a hybrid or fully cloud, now that's, as mentioned, shared responsibility model. You have to follow good practices. If you don't, you'll have to pay for it. Uh, nowhere you're saying that, okay, now your security is Azure's problem. No, you have to be an equal participant in the process. I mean, given e the, the convenience is a, it's clearly a very, very tempting offer, right? Uh, so few people would say no to that. But at the same time, it's, you have to step up as well. So it's not uh, for the faint of heart, to say the least. Yeah. I just wanted to add a few more things. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, from a security point of view, cloud is not so safe. Again, uh, it looks as though it's safe, but as you see, the trust is totally different here. On-prem trust is uh, you are trusting the entire environment, so it's in your premise, and you are, you are fine with that. But in cloud, you need to go follow the principle of zero trust architecture. So that means you cannot trust anybody. And that's where all the companies or industries are having a problem to migrate into cloud. The, the actual problem comes because of the data that is actually used by each of the products that each company is managing. If it is going to the PCI data like credit card, then they have to follow a totally different standards. Or if they are talking about the PI data wherein you have a person information or address or something, then you have to follow totally different standards. In that case, you need to build up a lot more solutions which currently the cloud doesn't provide. So in that case, even, uh, even from an MEDS point of view, we, since we are dealing with airline related information, we have to do a lot more enhancements in our product to deal with a lot more information, a lot more uh, obfuscation of the, of the information and then move to cloud. So it's not so cheap. Again, it's again for the students to see how to make it automated. But yeah, this is one challenge I think so every industry is facing. Although we see that, okay, we can do lift and shift and we can do faster approach to cloud, it's not so fast. Not we so still take years together. And I think so we have initially projected around two, three years, but I don't think so it's so easily doable. So it's definitely that it's still a long way to run about. But again, cybersecurity becomes more and more stringent with a lot more uh, security rules like PCI DSS, which becomes more stringent problems. And you can see that the PCI DSS 4 itself is extremely complicated to be followed by any industries. So that's where it's going to us. It almost seems like it took the pandemic for us to get more realistic with our migration estimates even. And we're still not there yet, but we are a lot more accurate now than we were three years ago, right? So um, changing gears uh, slightly, you mentioned privacy and PI data and all that. What do you think of the data protection bill? It was, I think, briefly mentioned in the budget this year, but what do you think? Does it have a future? What, what do you think is going to happen? I think, no, it, it's, it's making the accountability factor. Yeah. So if you talk about European countries, GDP was already there. If you talk about countries like Brazil, Mexico, Latin, they have very stringent law when it comes to privacy and company had to mandatory follow in order to run their businesses. Right. India was, you know, lagging but when you know IT act you mentioned everything is written in IT act your backups how much you have to retain but how many companies follow that 
the reason being plus i doubt if it said anything about uh, accountability in the in strict terms right that that yes, i think has been yeah, brought in right is. now so now when you talk about data protection bill i am not aware the no the entire what it is written but what i understand is the accountability towards protecting your data your employees data the controls that you want to employ it and when you transmit your data between entities how you have to mask your data and protect your data so the data classification becomes a very critical aspect you know, yeah. which has come now and every organization have to understand the classification aspect classify the data which is critical confidential you no know, low priority high priority and then put up a controls to maintain that classification as well so it's not you now creating a word document and you say you no know, somebody finance is showing it becomes confidential so controls should be enabled to understand the data and classify it automatically and when it is transmitted the data will be protected so the protection bill has come at the right time where india you know is is on the growth path and you know organization will have to adopt you know, sooner or later over that so the long and short of it is uh, that they have clearly defined who is a data broker who is a data owner data fiduciaries and so on and the accountability part that i mentioned earlier is that if it is found that you are guilty of whatever then you can be heavily fined and the fines can come from the government from ordinary citizens can anyone like anybody could accuse you and if you are actually found guilty as a fiduciary you will be heavily fined that's sort of the idea additionally what i saw um, in the in the latest act is also that uh, of course you know um, the fines and the penalties have significantly gone up and the other thing that i saw is um, you know as i said um, you know multinational companies um, hosting our data outside of india and if that data is compromised how quickly they should inform our government so a government wants to know who is interested in our data and what is happening so if there is a suspected incident or a suspected compromise we companies must inform our government immediately so the agency to this certain certain is a government agency which you no know, and it is you no know, sort of mandate from the government you know to organization that if any security incident happen you mm. should report in certain absolutely we need to inform we indian know. indian government and every government organization they have to mandatory forward there are no net flows and everything to the certain to analyze those it has not come to the private industry but sooner or later it has to come absolutely <coughs> would you like to add anything yes. when it uh, comes to i mean lot of companies that especially kpi datas there have already been a lot of regulations that have been followed worldwide and the gdpr is one of the most stringent ones right and it has been followed so once those regulations come especially i mean in india it has been lagging for sure uh, i mean our pi data is basically public anybody can access it anytime right <clears throat> so there was a need and once those regulations comes we have to follow it no i mean there's no Uh, doubt about it especially on the size of um, the healthcare industry and uh, the finance industry it has been mostly unregulated right most of the times so once i think it is the need and we'll have to see how much time does the government gives yeah. for them to uh, you know get into those compliances but but we are all optimistic about it yeah definitely right. so um i was thinking that we'll have a short questions break instead of accumulating audience questions at the end of uh, the session if you have questions please come come ahead and if at any point you feel like you have questions feel free to occupy the seats that are in the front um thank you everybody and i really feel privileged to have evs in the previous panel uh for uh, indian in paradox so the, the previous panel had discussed regarding industry exposure to students my question is around that uh, one free internet yeah, digital adoption across pan india for entertainment smart appliances devices overlooking the cyber security aspect across the internet i'm sorry program. could you please hold the mic a bit closer yeah. is it better much better sure so uh, free internet lot of digital adoption across india uh, smart and de uh, all devices across ignoring all the aspects of cyber security Uh, so we don't want the indian disorder to have being like sitting ducks having the devices to be used like ddos attacks like the malware you know because more adoption happening now with regards to in industry exposure what um, platform expo uh, exposure 
and incentives are the industry ready to provide to the students so that they are actively engaged within cybersecurity and industries like this, not at the end of their career during the internships, but right through when they start the start the course, uh, because they could be brand ambassadors of cybersecurity, creating awareness, uh, ensuring that people are mostly aware and they have and industries have less uh, uh, you know pain to have more cybersecurity. They would be also pipelines for the industry with getting the behavior of the end users of um, of these products and also help you create uh, any uh, preventive measures while trading products. And we as uh, uh, engineers would also be able to have uh, products built with cybersecurity as main aspect when we're building. So could you, could you summarize your first question quickly? Uh, my main question is to how, how in the industry exposure can be done to students right from the beginning of the career so that they can be brand ambassadors of cybersecurity, creating awareness, being a pipeline of information for the products, as well as you know, having a mindset to create cybersecurity as a main aspect when they're developing products and solutions got in it, the industry. So uh, let me flip the question a bit and say that each of you were invited to teach a course here in the BS program. Uh, so you probably know a bit about this, but we have a foundation level where uh, it's about maths and stats and a little bit of programming. Uh, a little bit of advanced uh, maths and stats as well. And then which is followed by a year or more of two pretty intensive diplomas, one in data science and one in programming. Let's say that, uh, and, and in the programming diploma, we learn about databases, we learn about application development and so on. Uh, if you were invited to teach a course within that diploma, a fairly long 12 week course, like what would you teach? That's, does that, would that be a, so would that be a fair proxy of the question you asked? Yes, that's right. So while students are learning this and you guys... So, so not uh, the, the course per se, but directly industry interaction through uh, engagement of students in the industry with their product services, understanding how they are built, so that they are ambassadors of cybersecurity across and we are becoming okay. in that okay. way. Yeah. Not just internships, but right from the beginning. Is, is the question clear? Uh, so... So I think, you know, uh, I'll answer your, the way you summarize it, right? So at the same time, his expectation is actually how we could actually get exposed exactly. to the industries, understand the way they actually <clears throat> work with or work for their clients, right? So that, you know, he's well prepared during the uh, academic time itself, right? I think that's, that's a, I mean, good ask, right? Uh, but the question is, how do we implement? Can I make a students part of my uh, client engagements? Uh, it's possible as part of the internship, but during the academic year, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer, but the question is, what is that they can actually learn, right? Let's say uh, things like, you know, a forensics, endpoint forensics or the network forensics, maybe not to the level three level, at least the level one is going to actually help them a lot, right? Understand the bad signals on the endpoints, understanding the bad signal from the network side. Because uh, majority of the <clears throat> solution that we have actually more of a, a signature way of you know detecting the threats, right? So you need to teach them what is a behavior analytics concept as such, where they can actually utilize uh, uh, the BA concepts to understand the bad signal or at least detect them. That could be a step up uh, to the current academic levels that we have, and definitely uh, put them into your programs. You know. Uh, in, uh, the internship kind of a programs in between where they actually be part of the uh, real SOC operations, right? So they're actually given a console with the read only. Now here is a threat, you know, how do you analyze it, right? right. Somebody is actually shadowing it. So, so when you say uh, level one, level one forensics, yeah. is, is that something you would expect uh, to some extent a uh, junior person to be able to manage. Yeah, I mean, as long as you have a TCPIP basics understanding, you will be able to analyze the, how do you uh, analyze the headers, somebody is actually I crafting see. a payload, how do you actually identify, how the negotiation usually happens at the application level I, I versus a mission that, versus uh, a user, right. right? So, so my actually, my specific question was like, somebody who's done a programming diploma here will be able to do that. Perfect. Now you actually put them into the real security operations yeah. center, see how they're actually doing it. Uh, but the question is, is it legally allowed and it is organization okay from their organization policy point, I think. <laughs> but a but uh, could, you, could you not perhaps, uh, you know, have a focus group or, you know, uh, use
who's asked for uh, some of our diploma holders to volunteer for this and you know invite them to review or detect your systems so of course uh, subject uh, to the compliance at your organization but does that seem like a good idea it's a good, it's a good idea yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's i think the I, uh, least you could i mean that's that's the lowest level of inter and somewhat relatively the easiest way of industry interaction to begin exactly and it also gives a feedback in you know, how your academic courses are actually working out. exactly yeah yeah but that's a very good question i'm glad you asked it okay so because um, security awareness is everyone's responsibility we've been talking about shared responsibility and it's it's ours and yours and everyone's right and um, and maybe a to answer to his question may not um, give a solution to it but definitely one route is jade for you to um, i recently met with uh, one of uh, senior folks from nascom and uh, they are bringing corporates um, and academia together and they're trying to build curriculum that so that you know end of their study they are able to join those organizations so nascom has taken that initiative um, not awareness even for job opportunities so we can definitely join hands together you are our pipeline right so we need you all to be equipped to learn and to be able to be with us so um, and and there is a need and it's a win win right so please do connect with nascom and uh, nascom is facilitating this uh, between you know building uh, try, trying to develop courses as part of their curriculum so that they are employable at the end of the program Right. so that's a route that we can take probably uh, instead of organizations connecting with you individually we we definitely can partner with nascom that's perfect because professor balaji and kamla ma'am are both right in the first row so can you can i add to that please 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 so when it comes to industry standards <clears throat> especially when it comes to cyber security you know cyber security today is mostly i would say 80% tools whatever tools you are using it might be microsoft sentinel or something else defender for cloud things like that so if you want to be industry um, needs to understand where exactly what happens in the industry what they do use these are the tools that are used and like coming to your question if i were to teach a course of course i mean you would have already already gone through the theories like mentioned sql injection https protocol how the post works how all those things right we can definitely have a program and there are certain aspects of security when you understanding one through the application deployment perspective how do you secure that then when the threat comes right how do you understand what is a threat how to identify how do you contain it right and how do you respond to it all those things so there are various aspects of it and uh, uh, you know i am part of uh, the worldwide learning in microsoft and we do a lot of program recently we did a program called uh, ggr that is girls go ready and uh, we i mean taught a lot of girls and privileged from smaller colleges uh, to make them industry ready so if something needs to be done like where there needs to be a program might not be 12 weeks that is like too long but we can definitely do some program where something we can shorter perhaps uh, focus on something specific like application security or threat modeling or threat detection all those things and uh, we can also give like in microsoft like uh, we don't have to put too much or expose our systems right we do have azure right and then we can give you the passes we can give you uh, maybe some application code which is broken then you have to identify what where it is broken all right and you learn as well so uh, i don't think that much compliance comes to the picture where you go to the education aspect of it so definitely if you want to get in touch let us know we can no, definitely I think do something we're definitely going to take you up on that uh, because we have had a few workshops on azure and there are uh, there are enough people who know azure basics but from a security perspective if you could have this as a workshop we'll definitely take you up on that I would like to add one thing. No, they always been an informal program running called as bounty hunters. Oh, ah, of course. Yes, yes. So you see, you now people who have very much interest, you no know, informal groups run where you no know, they try to find out vulnerabilities across you no know, various platforms. We have seen Google has rewarded, Microsoft has rewarded, LinkedIn has rewarded in past people you no know, finding the vulnerability and you know they publish it also. 
but i echo what the thing from industry is missing the case studies towards how you are securing your internal network see the cloud you no know, google microsoft everybody has a huge uh, you no know, infra they published a case study over the softwares algorithms you know, how you are spinning but i have not seen the case studies on the security aspects which can really help students to understand what is a recommended method of deployment so everything what you know teaches about the course but how those things are implemented they are stitched together to make a you know very agile resilient environment that that is missing so if industry want to teach if if they can publish not the entire thing but a case study how the existing practices are being done that will really help you know these students to you know come up to that level uh, what what they are asking uh, to respond to that um, i think the case studies are available lot of them not to the extent of uh, going i mean low level designs and things like that but on high level there will definitely case studies available Uh, if student wants, I mean, they can go to again Microsoft Architecture Center is there, and you can filter down whether whatever topic you want. You want app development, you want modern enterprise mobility solutions or cyber security solutions, data processing solutions. You can drill down on each uh, different product category, and then you can see a lot of uh, case studies are there. They are high level case studies. As as you mentioned, yes, definitely, uh, we need to be more detailed on what was the challenge and how it was. used uh, but again that is customer case study so it's only kept at the high level but yes the, some formats definitely we can you can get out of it so they may not be very popular uh, or as well exposed to the public as they should be and they are at a high level but i think your point is still well taken because there there is a drill down uh, that is needed and a very granular examination of this vivek would you like to add something please what would you teach and how would you no uh, first is everybody d- doesn't want to become a cyber security it's not that everybody has to become but first thing as a developer or a, as a student what i would like to stress is understand the basics first uh, be conscious of okay what is ethical that was the whole base for the previous discussion and actually that is the base for most of the security problems that's happening here uh, and also see that okay what are the from a development point or from any product understand okay what are the vulnerabilities that is possible and how that can be avoided with a simple design think simple and also evolve the product simply don't try to over complicate things that's where i would uh, look at now yeah if cyber security is taken at a course there are definitely lot of items which uh, all the colleagues have highlighted but one thing i also wanted to highlight from industry standpoint is uh, as a uh, architect i see that there is a lot of challenges from a solution architect also that means okay security wise we highlight the risks but to get the actual solution to the security is far more complicated so that is one thing is really missing from the industry standpoint so if there is any way we can uh, try to incorporate this as part of the initial set of the curriculum that will be much better i feel just a footnote there since this is uh, being recorded i wanted to add it where it's on record uh, one of our course instructors tejesh is uh, he's not here who takes the modern application one and two courses he ha- uh, has been having uh, conversations uh, with the rest of us about how to bring in content about more ethics ethical uh, development and so on all right uh, do we have another question please i think uh, i have a uh, i think this should be the last question from here so uh, something that i realized is the threat surface is continuously moving and you have you, almost you are doing catch up so what kind of uh, there are two things this being a data science program i mean how much of previous threat data previous uh, i mean measures being how much of that is relevant and the other thing is specifically on compliance so when uh, if you look at uh, finance industry the pci uh, measures or the gdpr they are very strict on the way data is being stored so if that kind of strictness come in how it is going to impact 
any future ml algorithms or the larger because in some sense uh, you are changing the way the data is actually is right i mean in some sense you are saying this data should not be visible to uh, another person i mean in, in some sense that's where i see it going so how do you think uh, i mean both data and infrastructure times uh, was uh, how is data science going to help cyber security or how is it helping cyber security any thoughts on that yeah so i think the first uh, half of your quest, first part of your question where how can we actually at all look at the past and predict uh, because it's basically what he's asking is uh, how practical is it to build supervised learning models to predict threats right and when does this model get out of data that that's a question we can comprehend at least yes. please go on. there are two parts to this uh, what i can answer how the data is being actually leveraged uh, to find security problems that's the first problem i can look at second thing is uh, how industry or any kind of research institute is trying to find out a problem to uh, finding finding out a solution to this problem so to 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 get to the first one uh, from a industry stand point of view you know that a lot of devices currently are spitting out lot of data and as part of gsoc uh, security compliance we have a event monitoring of all these things so if you can take off any kind of an uh, resource or any kind of a device that is kept uh, within the in, within the premise or any kind of a thing we have a proper data analysis done even currently it might be a dashboard kind of a thing but totally it, it's going to evolve as an ai ops around it so definitely from a security operation point of view it is going to evolve definitely and there is a very good opportunity for the students as well as for everybody to see how this can be uh, automated and how it can be figured out and there it is still uh, an ongoing study even in my company to understand is there a way to understand some of the problem is there a way to figure out some of the uh, threats up front before it actually becomes a huge uh, large scale that's the first thing second part of your question is regarding how can we uh, secure or how can we still keep the data encrypted and still make it as part of the data so there are some study that is going on it might not be in industry but in still in research what i have gone through from the various uh, outside courses we have something called federated uh, studies wherein we try to uh, do some kind of a learning local to that device and still keep it as part of the device you know that for an hospital you cannot exchange the data it's for sure you cannot do that uh, for most of the any of the data that's being Uh, very very private to the particular uh, organization that cannot be done so to deal with that especially we would try to do lot of uh, problem solving around how do we secure in terms of the data privacy that's first thing and can we rely on hashing of it so that still the data as a data is kept proper so that you can still uh, learn the data but in a more encrypted or hashed way so that is the one possibility that is been looked at and still keep the data within the device so these are the research areas that is being looked at and and currently when i last looked at it it was bit in a starting stage but yeah we are trying to see if we can go towards it and i think so my company is also looking into this field uh, in terms of okay airline what we are working on from mnd's point of view we are also seeing at a device level can we do some study still keeping the data at a private to the device so that's one thing uh, uh, if it is can be doable and is much much uh, better than that possible so. so that is really exciting like where can we learn more about this so the there are uh, first of all the few of this data related the problems that can be seen uh, it's not specific to airline industry i can tell mm. but there are few problems related to hospitality and uh, specially related to the 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 medical fields healthcare, which yeah. can healthcare so i would recommend you to go to the specific sites where in the, you can start off with uh, there is one college called inspire which i seen and there are few i think the kagal everybody is aware of it if yeah. if you are participating i myself do it as an offline activity but yeah you could really try to get some of these ideas and work about it how is data relevant data is very very relevant um i i can quote few examples in addition to what we just heard um user behaviors 
right are being i mean data is being i mean playing a big role in studying user behaviors so ad baselining right so we baseline who can access what kind of behavior can we expect from a user what is the data this user has access to from which location even if he or she is a traveler um so pro we we know which which are the the usual locations this user is going to access from so um help using the data that we have to to even suspect right and and to take some actions around it data is very relevant and today we can say that user behavior is becoming more and more focused because uh, we we keep talking about awareness insider threats um intentional unintentional whatever it is data is going to play a big role and it is playing a big role right ad baselining as i spoke about even device levels uh, device level um, controls are in place today which device can access if there's a different device that's accessing that's where data is going to help us analyze um and even in the um, ot environment that we spoke about ml right ml and and data together is helping us even so this So there are many organizations the the threats that we see today is not just the today's coding or today's infrastructure that we are bringing to the environment today we have a huge legacy could be more than 100 years and and there is a technology debt that we have created during pandemic or we keep creating because business has to run right while security is critical business is critical right we survive on that so we need to make sure that we make progress so every organization keep keeps creating those technology debts there's shadow it all of this we need data to help us where is this where, which is the the logical location of these devices what is the behavior that we can expect from these devices we spoke about ot's iot's throwing data just they just throw data throughout the day right so how do we use this data to be futuristic to be real at least near real time if not 100% proactive it's practically difficult so can we be near real time using your data data plays a major role i think whoever is studying studying data data science they have opportunity across including cyber security and we spoke about protecting the data so as i said ad baselines to all of these techniques are available who can access we can even say that only these devices can access this data right so yes very relevant i would like to add one thing when you say we are catching up we already were there it's only thing is we have become oh, we have come on front now if you talk about a few years back 5 to 6 years where did you get the data breaches news it was very less with the internet changing i think linkedin has become the first source of the information for everybody any breach you will first see on linkedin so we are not catching up we were already there yes the amount of the effort that we have to put it is changing now the other question where you have a fear that you know if we install anything on your computer how we are going to develop say so tell you our company has close to around 8000 developers and we have taken the local admin accesses can you can you develop without taking you know local admin access you can't but we have done it so it was a fear with the developers that they can't do it but the right technology can help you do that so i do not give access to powershell to my developers so what we do is we create white list what you want will give it what version you want give it so we are helping you in making your development secure what you fear is that no somebody might be tracking what i am doing see you are working for organization why can't organization can track it so you have to put up a reasoning why you need that if you need that nobody can deny that every company loves r&d every comes no company loves no new product development and everything so the need is you become a brand ambassador to the cyber security controls rather than giving you know a sort of counter argument that my development might be slow so that will ease it's it's a balance you know to make the environment secure this is very relatable of course because i i got a like pip install something and it's blocked <laughs> but i can't work without yeah. it clearly we adopted zero trust framework in you know, 
and i would say my you know entire company all resources they are using this so we have you know controls in place where we have a caspi controls we have secure web gateway controls in, in fact it has been almost 2 years that we are not giving you know anybody the access to personal gmail ids they cannot do an attachment they cannot send in fact recently we have blocked the public github also so if you have a company github you will be allowed to access otherwise it becomes a view only mode and they cannot open you know those sites so what we are doing is we are helping two ways in making sure the threats do not come inside and whatever you are trying to upload we we are checking whether it's company data or pri- private data so technology adoption is purchase is easy the adopting creating the mam brand ambassadors and making sure there is a balance between you no know, roll outs and the people who are adopting it it's it's fine it's also a lot about habits yeah. that takes time to cultivate of course mm-hmm. so um, we are well within time of course but uh, since there are no more questions i'd like to close off on the thread of ot security that we left unsolved earlier so clearly you know whoever built stuxnet was not interested in stealing data only as such right like they wanted to destroy stuff this is again i think by the very nature of our conversation it seems like it's only data privacy and security that we that's weighing on our minds most of the times but what about the rest what are the other security problems that we have i think the ot control i mean ot technology used to be more of a air gapped in the past right so and uh, these systems actually they run on a legacy environment and that's another head act now because of the digital innovation you have to actually a convergence uh, between it and ot that's where the uh, the security risk actually started popping up Right? Yeah, I mean, we can't afford to keep it air gap right, forever. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, how do we actually have the benefit at the same time? How do we make sure that you know the OT is not impacted? Because you can't change the OT, right? So you can't actually make those Windows XP and Windows 98 machines to the the latest Windows 10, right? That's the way they are actually. Uh, but can you actually create a middle layer where there are plenty of vendors who's actually uh monitors like uh, one could concept ma'am ma'am said you know the behavior analysis there is something also called entity behavior analysis right entity is something every object you know your machine is entity your ssl certificate is entity your actually application is entity right when i continuously monitor under a machine learning uh, kind of a data science models using and understand what is the behavior of this Uh, the OT platform, the way they actually communicate, you create a pattern. You create a baseline, you understand the pattern, you monitor for the deviation, right? At the same time, that's going to be a middle layer, more from the monitoring perspective. You could also actually implement the, the prevention and detection controls around it while you're actually giving the benefit of the convergence. So it's not just monitoring, it can be invasive also. Like it can actually take actions at the middle layer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the that's a middle layer that you need to actually rely on. absolutely and i think as you rightly mentioned um, it devices have a shorter lifetime right um, life cycle while the ot they they stay for decades so there are uh, firmware you know patches that cannot be done firmware upgradations that cannot be done because they stay with us for decades and and the the worrying part is uh, gartner says that our ot systems can be weaponized by 2025 not too far right so because there are dangerous industry systems that that are now the the scadas the the um the plcs all of those sensors and uh, semi automated machineries that we have can be compromised they're all on the network so they can be compromised and um, i would suggest this this a recently scary um, ransomware or a malware that we read about is cosmic energy i'm sure you all might have heard about it which actually targets power grids they can turn on turn off and and can power grids can be compromised with that malware so and this was found on virus total so for what purpose we don't know but this is where we are right and uh, ot security is a huge opportunity because we've invested a lot on endpoint controls firewalls um i you know prevention controls detection controls and all that 
now it is definitely every organization is focusing a lot on ot controls because this is cyber physical harm this is going to harm people it's going to impact lives um it can do just imagine a sensor you know or that controls the temperature right and um, and and this is just compromised so this is the the phase we are all in right so ot is a, as as i said is a huge opportunity and we're bringing and and the the digital transformation that every organization is going through is adding more and more iots but i think this this is a huge opportunities where even academia focus can focus on ot security right make it part of the curriculum so if we are introducing uh, even in the instrumentation a sensor how how do we make sure that it is secure because it is going to harm it's physical harm to people and they are they can be weaponized as i said so as as we mentioned first understanding you know what what are those devices getting a complete inventory or uh, a set of all of those devices that we have having a close monitoring and applying zero trust on each of them right it can be any user any asset any application can bring harm right can can be compromised and making sure that we do micro segmentation to be able to manage and secure each of those application level micro segmentation and making sure that there is a lot of user awareness probably we are so used to technology we are we talk about it we know it is important but it is important for those who are operating in the plants as well to know that it can harm it can be so harmful so ori security is definitely critical and i think every organization is now looking at it and investing on it probably because of the gap that we have created and they stay with us for decades together is is vikas kumar here by any chance okay so a uh, classmate of ours who actually maintains an ot system so i just wanted to see if he's around and uh, could add to the conversation but anyhow i think the one system though i am not expert on ot but what i've you know, seen is the ot system primarily now they are connecting to internet and that was the need of the hour so the older system what missing is the visibility and in ot the manufacturers they write their own code their own protocols and everything over the period of time manufacturing industry once something comes in their shelf life is more for it system i can replace easily in manufacturing it is very difficult to replace so i think ot entire manufacturing system they are gearing up to come to certain unification standards now we talk about replacing of the scada with you no know, certain other technology which gives the entire visibility and if you don't have visibility you cannot protect it the first case so to bring to that visibility level efforts are being made and once you have visibility then definitely industry will come up to understand take the data and put up more controls so i think that phase has started you know in our larger front you know i have seen manufacturing i last week i was somewhere so many pharmaceutical industry also facing the same problem we you know more and more landscape especially after the pandemic which is coming where india become more focused in vaccine driven organization using consuming the apis and everything so they are also concerned so the race has started where to protect the resources while you know doing the micro segmentation minimizing the internet footprint and you know, giving the services uh, one major issue that i see with um, the ot technology especially is the lack of standardization because it runs across industries and how do you bring it right there was perhaps never an opportunity to bring yes. that standardization yes in. Uh, especially in terms of security nobody thought about it now once they are connected to the inter there is a concern coming that is a good thing uh, so <clears throat> i mean especially if i think i am mean, also not an expert on ot to be honest uh, if your devices are coming onto the internet you better have a network segmentation not put directly on it have some mechanisms where all of the devices are on a separate network not everybody can access it and i think my this is peer, perhaps the middleware that babu was referring to yes about. and my viewers also saying about zero security model see in any cyber security threat landscape you can solve 95% of your problems if you follow very very some basic things especially uh, you know if you talk about ot's 
these are manufacturing devices they might come with some chip that chip might already have some authentication mechanism built into it right and they might already come with a default username password how many people are bothered to change their default username password right very simple thing uh, but if you change if your that your username password is admin admin please, <laughs> change please change it right now yes so that is very basic thing keep your systems up to date make sure it is not on standard processes that comes directly from the manufacturer uh, then also who has access to it all your critical uh, whether it is power grid uh, healthcare systems or any other systems that you are building or or operating uh, there has to be controls where it says like zero security model just in time access and uh, your uh, conditional access uh, like my friend also says that uh, in local they have local admin access generally do not give people uh, admin access at all especially on especially like people things like power grids and stuff where they will need to change systems no you need to have elevated access and only for the time being where they need to change something that's right. interesting because then you know uh, ot security could actually have a lot to borrow from us in that case a lot of practices basically in fact this is part of iam when you talk about you know, one year in time my it team they do not have their low, no privilege level password because everything is going to the vault they are logging and doing it so all these tool set technologies are there the thing is you have adopt it and enforce it at every level not the end point but the it also because the threats most of the threats evolve from the people who have privileged accesses you control it you know minimize your risk level from high to low automatic so <clears throat> great we are at time do we have time for maybe one question or should we stop Okay, we'll we'll take one last question. Yes, so one last question. Uh, as an industry, what are your views with regards to uh, security adoption by the government uh, with the largely available data? Where are they currently now? Is it quite secure? Is it largely vulnerable? And is it possible for students to take up projects through the industry, which would affect the community level? So for you, it could be a CSR activity for us could be projects. So we are working for the community, and and not work looking for you know this off post office jobs. I have worked four years with government, um, and I have seen state data center, or state wide area network. And if you see, if you study the government's NEGP model, National E Governance Plan, it is started way back in year 2008. And these are called as mission mode product. You, the classic example is a passport. Passport was a mission mode project, and it was implemented throughout the country. And have you heard about Megraj? Megraj is you know, the cloud framework, and the entire government of India cloud that was there since 2008. You have heard about NIC, National Informatics Centers, an agency you know throughout India, where you know every state they have scientists and they are working you know to maintain the security, bring those standards. Government of India is very much aware; they were aware. It's only that now the communication is open. What efforts they are putting up? i feel that previously those were not open no what they are doing is now government is more vocal about no putting their efforts so if you reach out to maybe nic and others definitely they have very much you know well established framework to help student and adopt them as a trainee and they will deal it. nascom is one of the example right? so things are there similarly you talk about the industry yes industry they are there but maybe those programs are not open but if you reach out to them definitely they will help you in you know getting absorbed giving your valuable inputs and making helping you know uh, everything secure uh, well i have a funny story actually when it comes to uh, you know interacting with government organization um, we had one client um, it was a state uh, higher education board and they had some issue and then i went on a call um, and to identify the issue we tell, told them okay log into the server right go ahead and uh, nobody knew the password server we were calling okay do you know the password what's happening um, and then uh, somehow they got the password all right somebody sent them on a email plain text and we were sh sharing screen of course because we wanted to see and then they opened the password right in front of her they log in so 
see i think we are coming back to where we started i mean the our discussion right is the human part of it governments can do a lot of things and as my friend mentioned nic's have been there for a long time for the digital implementation and especially in the last few years it has been accelerated on a very large scale and uh, that uh, the digital india innovation and all of our systems whether it is government systems have been uh, you know even moved to um, sometimes cloud or you know innovated or modernized but you have to enforce that culture into the people and in corporate it is a bit easy because we have uh, that kind of push in government it is a bit more difficult yeah but how do you motivate an entire army of people to change their habits just a funny story yeah. that i remember when it came to government all right uh, that has been great uh, this i'm pretty sure that uh, most of us were not even aware that this is a significant problem at all now we know it is there now we know it has to be a part of the inherent lowest level process and we also know where to look for solutions now. so thank you so much for this Thank you all. Uh so that concludes the session over here we had uh, two interesting panels uh I think uh yeah uh, i hope students also got a uh, brief understanding of what all opportunities exist both from a skill perspective as well as uh, now cyber security is something that we have not extensively covered in our uh, uh, curriculum so to say but how important is it to look at security uh, from uh, right from the start and what all practices have to be done i think that's uh, pretty important uh so that concludes the event over here and i think uh, uh we'll meet here uh, in the second half around 2 pm where the prize distributions for volunteers and others are going to happen so thanks a lot for all the students who were here uh, we'll see you in the second half of uh, the session now uh, industry uh, people uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming in Uh, i think we can move together towards the lunch that has been organized for you yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot everyone